Hello, happy 4th of July. I hope you're having a great day. Um, it is another wonderful day in quarantine, so um, <laughs> I am celebrating from a distance with my friends and family, but um, I feel grateful because I and my family were safe and everyone's healthy, um, so I hope you guys are doing really well. I wore my favorite shirt for um, the 4th of July. It's Happy Treason Day, you ungrateful colonials. And um, I love the shirt so much because it's unexpected for 4th of July. Most people are not history nerds. And um, it's kind of neat. So um, I'm going to get back into our book. And we left off at a pretty exciting time. Um, the last thing we know, Isabel was staying with Lady Seymour. And um, you know, she finally went to sleep. And then it, the last sentence was, when I woke, the city of New York was consumed with burning hellfire. And so we were trying to figure out, oh my goodness, what is happening? What is burning hellfire? Let's find out, okay? So we're going to be starting on chapter 31, and our primary source from that time period, um, Saturday, September 21st, through Sunday, September 22nd, 1776. And I'm going to just close... I always get all these pop-ups sometimes when I'm filming, which is kind of annoying. Um, all right, here we go. The fire raged with inconceivable violence, and in its destructive progress swept away all the buildings between Broad Street and the North River. Several women and children perished in the fire. Their shrieks joined to the roaring of the flames, the crash of falling houses, and the widespread ruin, which everywhere appeared, formed a scene of horror great beyond description, and which was still heightened by the darkness of the night. And this is from the New York Mercury newspaper. So really bad fire, um, very, very scary. They don't have, um, you know, like they're going to have wagons maybe pulling buckets of water, but they're not going to have um, a sophisticated fire fighters and um, systems for helping with that as we do today. And even today when we have all the stuff we do, we still have um, pretty big damage done by fires. Um, like this last year we had the, the campfire that um, wiped out that whole town. So um, fire is a very, very, very dangerous thing and um, something that that we have record of um, from these primary sources um, so that we can tell what it was like, um, what people saw, what they felt, and then what the devastation was. So let me just take my sip of coffee and then we will get into it. Oh, also I hope um, you guys got a chance to watch Hamilton yesterday because it's finally on. Um, streaming, so I was really excited. Mr. Daly and I finally got to watch it, and of course I was crying and laughing, but... All right, here we go. I awoke coughing so hard I near brought up my supper. When I finally caught my breath, I smelled the smoke and saw the light, bright as day outside my window. I jumped from the bed and peered out. It was not morning. It was an inferno. Flames curled out of all the windows next door. The rooftop beyond that was a lake of fire. Every building in sight was burning. The air was filled with crackling and popping sounds, with shrieks and screams coming from the street below. A hot gust of wind blew the curtains back and sent the fire straight at me. Fiery shingles floated from the roof and caught in the branches of the tree outside my window, setting the bark ablaze. A burning leaf drifted to the sill. I quickly brushed it off, my hands quivering. Get out! Seized again by coughing, I fell to the ground where the smoke was not so heavy. I pulled my shoes towards me and quickly buckled them on, then took a deep breath, rose to my feet, and grabbed Ruth's doll off my bed and opened the door. Smoke filled the hall, curling down from the ceiling along with fingers of fire. Get out now. I clattered down the stairs, screaming, Fire! Fire! The door to Lady Seymour's bedchamber was just opening. As I went to pass by, she grabbed my arm. Quick, child, she cried. Help me. Her chamber was even brighter than the attic, but the windows were covered and the smoke thinner. She bent over an enormous trunk by the wall. It contains my valuables. She pulled at the handle. Please, Isabel. I reached for the handle and tugged. The trunk did not move. It's too heavy, ma'am. Leave it. The roof is afire. No, wait. She flung open the top. The trunk was filled with a silver tea set, a small portrait of a yellow-haired man, something wrapped in velvet cloth, dusty sack, small wooden boxes and packets of letters tied in a ribbon. There was another crash outside and screams. I grabbed her arm. We'll die if we stay. She pulled out the letters and two small boxes and thrust 
them at me along with the portrait. Take these. I stuck the portrait and letters in my pocket and balanced Ruth's doll on top of the boxes in my arms. The room was so hot I thought the corn husks might explode into flames. Lady Seymour grabbed two of the sacks. The coins within clinked together as she rose to her feet coughing. Hurry, she gasped. The smoke in the hall was thicker than it had been moments before. We felt our way one step at a time to the staircase. I went down first with the lady behind me, her frail hand on my shoulder. My eyes watered. My lungs felt like they were pulling in the flames. I thought for a moment we were trapped. The thick haze tricked my mind, and I knew not if we should proceed down or up. My ears filled with the crackle of burning wood. Help me, Lady Seymour cried. Her hand vanished. Ma'am? Ma'am! The smoke stopped up my throat. There was a thunderous crash overhead, a ceiling giving way, or a piece of the roof collapsing. The old woman had crumpled to the stairs. Is she dead? I put my hand on her chest. Her heartbeat was light and fast as a bird's wing beating against a cage. I put my face close to hers and screamed, Get up! She moaned once and tried to move her hand. I pulled her arm. She moaned again. But I could not be gentle. I dropped the boxes and doll, draped her arm around me, and half fell down the rest of the stairs. Once on the ground floor, she tried to walk, but one of her legs was failing her. I opened the front door and dragged the two of us out onto the street. The air was a swirl with flame, soot, and burning shingles, each caught in a devilish whirlwind. The cries and screams of men and women mixed with the terror of the horses burning alive in their locked stables. Windows exploded. Beams crashed and trees split, their crowns ablaze like torches in the hand of a cruel giant. I felt the cloth on my back ready to ignite. The brand on my cheek scorched, as if the fire within me called to the fire in the air. Move or die, whispered the flames. I dragged Lady Seymour north, then east, away from the course of the wind, which blew like bellows and fanned the flames. British soldiers looted a burning house, running out with arms full of silver and forks and spoons sticking out of their pockets. A dog ran by howling, its tail on fire. We passed a family, all in their nightclothes, throwing buckets of water against the wall of their house. As the fire chewed through the wood, a group of men had harnessed themselves to a fire wagon that held a large tank of water, but one of the wheels broke and it proved too heavy to drag. One more block and we could go no farther. Lady Seymour and me collapsed in a heap on the edge of the graveyard. Time burned up while we lay there, caught in the sparks that flew overhead, swallowed by the noise of a city ablaze. When I finally came to my senses, I sat up, coughed at length, and breathed in slow. It hurt, but it would not be the death of me. Lady Seymour still lay beside me, shaking her head from side to side in the dirt and muttering. I bent my ears close to her head. The bells! Where are the bells? she asked. Had the fire ruined her mind? Why worry about bells? You're safe, ma'am, I said, patting her hand. She frowned. Why don't the bells ring alarm? Her words were garbled like she was talking underwater, but I finally understood. Every bell in every church steeple should have been ringing loud and fearsome, but they were all gone, melted and reformed into cannons. So that would be there, like we, in school, we have our fire alarm that we practice with our drill. Um, and in a colonial village, they would have the bells usually at the top of a really important building um, that would make that, that sound a lot so that people would be, you know, wake up and be warned, but that wasn't there. So that's, um, you know, if we were gonna try to think about one of the reasons this might have been such a devastating fire, that might be one of them because people didn't have warning to get out. All right. I stood up. Over the rooftops I could see men pouring water on the flattish roof of St. Paul's, the buckets handed to them from a long line of people that stretched to a backyard pump. To the south, Trinity Church was not as lucky. Its tall steeple was a pyramid of fire, the flames licking the undersides of the clouds that scuttle above. What shall we do, ma'am? I asked. Her tears turned black as they rolled through the soot on her face. Her left arm and leg lay limp as if some cog within her had snapped. She did not make a sound. Twas up to me to make the decision. Come, I helped her sit to sit. We need to make our way to safety. I stood to her left, draped the useless arm over my neck, and held her body tight to mine. In that manner, step by slow step, we staggered on. 
We pass countless people standing in the streets like statues, their toes bare on the stones, nightclothes blowing in the unnatural breeze, mouth agape. Carts rolled by carrying half-naked people, bleeding and dazed. A collection of charred bodies had been stacked on a corner, not fully covered by a blanket. A child's boot and stocking lay in the gutter, next to an overturned rail, rain barrel. Step by slow step, we made our way to Wall Street, then down to the seventh house on the left. She was near insensible by the time we reached it. In truth, I pinched her as hard as I could. It roused her some, and she lifted her working leg. Thus we mounted the steps of the locked-in house and entered the front door. So we might think about, um, did Isabel have to save her? No. But she did. Um, she could have escaped. She could have run away. I mean, definitely a lot of confusion. People could have thought that she died. But um, she did what she felt was right. She chose to help um, Lady Seymour. And... Um, we might ask why. Why do you think she helped her? Okay, next chapter. Sunday, September 22nd, Thursday, September 26th, 1776. Our distresses were very great indeed before, but this disaster has increased them tenfold. Many hundreds of families have lost their all and are reduced from a state of affluence to the lowest ebb of want and wretchedness destitute of shelter, food, or clothing. And this is from the New York Mercury newspaper. So people are going to go from being incredibly wealthy to having nothing in, in one fire. And um, we, we saw um, in our current news um, that it took a really long time for many people to get their insurance after their homes burned in the campfire. Some people, I mean, that happened almost, a, I think it was a year ago today, or not today, but like a year ago from now, and people are, some of them are still waiting to get um, support, um, but that's a little different than um, at this time period, because there might not be that much support that, um, they're, I mean, they're fighting right now, um, the American Revolution, to try to make their own government, and so... Um, Whereas today we would have different supports that the government would be offering. They're in the middle of war and they're trying to figure out who's going to be in charge. So not a lot of support really available for people that would lose their belongings in a fire like this. Um, okay. Near 500 homes were destroyed that night, plus shops, churches, and stables. Thousands of people were homeless without even a change of underclothes or clean stockings. Many did not eat meat for weeks on account of the death smell that poisoned the air. The job of finding bodies was so gruesome it caused grown men to scream out loud. They buried the dead quickly. Folks said the fire started in a low groggery near the White Hall ship slip. Um, from there, it burned down, pushed by a strong wind devouring Bridge Street, Dock, Stone, Market Field, and Beaver. Then it ran up both sides of Broadway. Almost everything from Broadway to the edge of North River was in ruins, all the way up the, to the open field below King's College. They called it the Burnt Over District. God's judgment on the British, whispered the Patriots. Rebel sabotage, shouted the Loyalists. Most figured the Americans wanted New York burned to the ground to leave the British without shelter. While the fires still raged, groups of soldiers searched for arsonists. One man, found with rosin and brimstone tipped slivers of wood in his pocket, was tossed into a burning cobbler shop. Another was quickly executed with a bayonet through the chest. Half a dozen people were hung while the fire still raged. One from the signpost of a tavern. Another was hung from his heels and had his throat slashed. The day after the fire, they captured a schoolteacher, name of Nathan Hale, up island near the Dove Tavern. He admitted he was a spy, but said he did not set the fire. There was no trial, no proof of his guilt. They put a rope around his neck and hung him high. Folks talked about a pretty speech he gave afore they killed and stole him away from his feet. He said he was sorry that he could only die one time for his country. The lobsterbacks laughed at that. So um, if you remember back um, to class when we were studying um, espionage and the revolution, um, we, we learned about Nathan Hale and how he was the first um, uh, spy executed in the American Revolution and how it just really um, hit George Washington hard and he started to think about how he needed to run a better um, spy game, if you will, and so he ended up starting the Culper Spy Ring, and um, 
we have lots. We, we did a deep dive in my class about that. Um, but so maybe I'll make a blog, blog post this summer about that because there's some really neat people that were um, involved in that. And it's pretty fun. Some women, which I thought was really interesting. And then an African American in, um, man who posed as an enslaved person um, to be able to infiltrate Benedict Arnold's camp. So, yes, I will get more information for you guys about that. All right, here we go. I coughed up mouthfuls of soot for days. Oh, Miss Sophia, are you squeaking your toy? She has her Scooby-Doo toy that she's very excited about. Come here, come on. Get up. Get up, little one. Good girl. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> um, no matter how much I rub them or rinse them with clean water, they remain swole up, red and hard to see out of. I was lucky. I was not killed or burnt. I had not even twisted an ankle running from the flames. All I lost in the confusion was Ruth's doll. All I had lost was everything. My bees swarmed back in my brain pan. They hummed loud, so I need not ponder on the baby doll. The burned over district looked like the inside of me. It was hard to tell where one stopped and the other started. I feared my wits had been melted by the flames, twisted and charred. Dr. Destuge came to examine Lady Seymour. The left side of her body had gone to sleep and would not wake. The doctor said it was an apoplexy brought on by the fire. He bled her twice and prescribed Mardinette's drops of clen to cleanse her blood. Master Lockton insisted his aunt should recover in the bedchamber he shared with his wife. Madame was not pleased with the arrangement, but said nothing for a change. She visited the ruins of the Seymour house daily, waiting for them to cool enough so she could poke through the ash with a hoe in search of coin or melted silver. Sophia, you are so loud, little girl. Oh my goodness, she's so funny. She loves her little Scooby-Doo thing. We get um, the bark box, and she just loves all the toys that come with it. But all of them have a little squeaker in it. Um, there, I just stole this from her. So this is her little Scooby-Doo that she loves. Okay, go play. Go get it. Get out of here, you. So we're getting more character development. Um, we're seeing how Lady um, Mrs. M Mrs. Lockton, um, we know she wasn't very fond of Lady Seymour, but now we're really seeing it. Um, she doesn't even want her um, in her home to recover. She's not really worried about like, oh, let me make sure she's okay. She's going to the, her burnt down house and checking, you know, is it cool enough that I can start to sift through the ashes and get all her um, silver and, and anything that's left over from the fire to make money off of. Lady Seymour called me to her bedside when she regained her senses. She tried to thank me, but the affliction pulled at her mouth and made it hard to figure her words. I gave her the portrait of the yellow-haired man and the letters that I'd stuffed in my pocket as we fled. She studied them close with her good eye. Then she sobbed and both her eyes overran with tears. Madam bade me to leave the room. By the third day after the fire, the Lockton house was packed tighter than a barrel of salt cod and smelled worse. We had been invaded again. Many of the rebel houses that were occupied by the British army had burned to the ground. Soldiers found themselves as homeless as regular folk, so their commander ordered that anyone with an undamaged home share it with the men. We wound up with eleven fellows from Kent sleeping three to a bedchamber and using the second floor drawing room as their common area for dining and conversating. The master and madam moved their bedchamber to the downstairs front parlor and gave the library over to Colonel Hawkins, a high-ranking officer whose favor Lockton sought. The cellar was turned into a barracks for five soldiers who had their wives with them. This was the Lord's blessing on me because the women were used to cooking and cleaning for their men's regiment. The new boss lady in the kitchen was named Sarah, a black-haired gal with a baby in her belly. She was not a friendly sort, none of them were, but she did not call me names nor seem inclined to hand out beatings. I did miss Miss Becky more than I thought possible. It was odd sleeping in the cellar with strangers. They sure did snore, the women as bad as the men. Their bodies gave off noxious odors, too. Gas is so strong they made my eyes water. The night of the first frost, I woke up to a soldier pulling off my blanket. I lay in the dark, fist clenched and teeth sharp, thinking he meant to do me harm. He did not. He was simply cold and in need of another layer of cloth. Next morning, Sarah agreed I could move my pallet up to the kitchen hearth. It was lonely sleeping without that fool doll. So, something she was able to hold on from Ruth, but now it's gone. Um, Alright, I'm going to go kick my Sophia out of my office. Um, so, 
while I am um, doing that, I want you to just take a moment and think about why do you think that doll's so important to her? Um, why do you think when it was so precious to her she lost it in the fire? What might she have been focusing on? Okay, I'll be right back. Miss Sophia, get out of here. Go, 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 go. Get out of here. Kick, kick, kick. Go, go, go. She's such a silly girl. Okay. I'm back. Okay, next chapter. Friday, September 27th through Saturday, November 16th, 1776. Many of the inhabitants are come into town, and many others who were obliged to fly for their loyalty are coming in daily. New York Mercury newspaper. So we do have a lot of records from the Mercury newspaper from New York, um, and it's really fun actually to go through and look at the different um, newspaper entries because you can learn a lot about a society by what they're publishing as news and how they see the world. And sometimes it's really fun too to see the political cartoons that they have. Um, so if you get a chance, um, you're ever looking, you know, looking some stuff up for one of your history classes, you might check that out. It's, it's pretty fun. I know in our, in our classes here, we, um, we looked at some political cartoons and some different images. It was pretty neat. The autumn passed in a dog weary haze for me with much work and little time to ponder or breathe. Everything was cloaked in gray, oyster gray, charcoal gray, pewter gray, mold gray, storm gray, and ash. Scraps of ash floated through the air for weeks and found their way into everything from the butter to the tea. The rains turned to ash to mud. Frost painted the ground the color of a gravestone, ashes trapped in ice. I flaked ashy too. Mama used to rub a salve of bear fat and mint on us as winter approached so our skin would not dry and crack. Was Ruth's skin dry? Did anyone notice? Ashes drift into the hollow places in my bones and silted up my brain pan. I had the fanciful notion that perhaps we had died in the fire and that we were all lost souls forbidden to enter heaven. When I had low thoughts like that, Kirsten's voice would call from my remembering and tell me to join him to become a rebel. I told that voice to hush. With the ash so thick inside and out, I had a few thoughts to spare for that fool. I figure he was dug in with the troops at Fort Washington, which seemed a good place, what with the strong walls and the cannons protecting it. Folks said the British wouldn't attack the fort until spring. The men drilled and patrolled. Sarah and the other soldier wives spent most of their days down at the campground doing the chores for the regiment, washing clothes in a big iron pots and cooking whatever could be found to roast or stew. They did some tidying at the Lockton's house and kept the officers fed too. The dirtiest jobs fell to me water hauling, wood chopping, and chamber pot emptying. On top of that, Colonel Hawkins claimed me for his errand girl, sending me out with messages for his captain or that sergeant or in search of snuff or hair powder or almonds. He was terrible fond of almonds. By the time the apples were harvested, hundreds of ships crammed with expensive British goods crowded the docks. The price of food doubled and doubled again. This did not affect the Lockton's nor the rich loyalist refugees who streamed into the city toting bags of gold. We took delivery of enough potatoes to fill the bin in the cellar and had no trouble buying meat, but regular folks burnt out of their homes and penniless, penniless loyalist refugees on the run from the rebels, they were forced to shelter in Canvas Town, the new name for the burnt over district. They used tent canvas to make huts against the standing chimneys and half crumbled brick walls. They ate beans and rice when they were not lucky and begged on the streets when they, when they were lucky they ate beans when, let me read that again. <laughs> they ate beans and rice when they were lucky and begged on the streets when they were not. One day I noticed that the plants grown from mama seeds had been killed by the frost. The stalks dead on the ground with shriveled paper leaves. A lump of mud stuck in my throat. I had forgotten to care for them. I collected the few seeds left from the flower heads and wrapped them in a scrap of cloth that I lay under a loose board in the pantry where I hid my sliver of lead from the king's statue. As the weather turned colder, Lady Seymour's mind cleared and her body strengthened. She could walk with help and move the crippled arm some, but her mouth still dragged at the corner and her speech was hard to follow. Madame was not entirely pleased that her husband's aunt was mending. I heard her grumble to Lockton that the old biddy will never die just to spite us. A month or so after the fire, I was settling down, setting down a clean pitcher of water in Lady Seymour's bedchamber whilst Madame read the newspaper aloud to her. 
I thought the lady was dozing, but her eyes snapped open when Madame described how British soldiers had looted the city hall library. They stole books, ruined paintings, and broke scientific equipment stored there by the professors of King's College. Lady Seymour made Madame repeat the entire story, then demanded pen and ink and paper, fighting her way out of the blankets with her good arm. Once dressed warmly and settled at the writing table, she composed a strongly worded letter about the library destruction to General Howe, supreme commander of the royal forces, and called for a glass of brandy and a bowl of soup. After that, it fell to me to walk with Lady Seymour along Wall Street on days when the sun was strong. She hired three seamstresses to sew her a new wardrobe and included a heavy skirt and thick woolen cloak for me in the order. I protested that I could not pay for the clothes, but Lady Seymour simply pointed to the portrait of the yellow-haired man, her husband, on the mantel and his letter stacked next to it. We'll not discuss payment again, she said slowly. Thank you, ma'am, I said. After the pigs had been slaughtered and fresh pork was for sale in the market, another wave of British officers moved in and set up their camp beds in the second floor drawing room. The long dining table was covered end to end with maps. The men would stand over them, chins in their hands, trying to figure out how to finish off the rebels. They were now scheming to finish the war in time for the new year. Battles and skirmishes were fought on the north part of New York Island, though the city was safe. Whilst they plotted Washington's downfall, I dozed in a chair in the hallway in case they needed victuals or a bottle of port. Sleep was rare and precious thing to me in those days. The next day I was yawning hard as I trudged up to the tea water pump. The November wind carried the promise of snow, and I was glad for the new cloak Lady Seymour had given me. Soon I would need rags to wrap around my hands. My muddied head did not register the great hullabaloo at first, but then my ears awoke. Folks were shouting and hurrying towards the Greenwich Road, where it dumped out onto the commons. I was not sure what the race was for, but I lifted my skirts and joined along with it. They got him, cheered a red-faced man, throwing both of his arms into the air. They got him all. By the time I made it to the commons, I had to fight my way to the front of the cheering mob. The end of the Greenwich Road, which was lined with British soldiers, relaxed and laughing as their prisoners captured American soldiers walked three to a row between their enemies through the doors of the Bridewell prison. Was there a battle? I asked the serving girl next to me. Up the fort, she answered. Them Hessians killed lots. Blood was running like water, they say. They fired them cannons from the ships, blew arms and legs everywhere, heads too. I nodded, unable to think what I should say. A chant started in the crowd, and singing. I did not join in, nor did I throw clods of mud, as many did, including the bloodthirsty girl next to me. The rebels kept coming in, row after filthy row, most with their heads down, some limping with a crutch or an arm in a sling. Their uniforms were torn and tattered. A few walked barefoot over the icy cobblestones, flinching when hit square with mud or a rock. They carried neither flag nor weapons. Their breath billowed like they were hard-ridden horses. It hung around their heads like smoke. He was toward the end of the line with the other enlisted slaves. His head bent forward, his face invisible. A bloody bandage was tied above his right knee, and it looked painful to step with his right foot. The only way I knew him was that hat, near brown than red now, with a rip through the brim and the ring in his ear. The guards shoved the last of the prisoners, including the boy with the red-brown hat, through the doors of the prison and closed them with a loud metal clang. So who is it? Yeah, it's Kirsten. <sighs> okay. Next chapter. Sunday, November 17th. Sunday, November 24th, 1776. We have now got near 5,000 prisoners in New York, and many of them are such ragamuffins as you never saw in your life. Letter of a British officer published in the London Packet newspaper. So, it's a tough war. They don't have as many supplies. They're not as well trained as the British army is. And rules of war, once you're captured as a prisoner, you're supposed to be taken care of well. It's one of those things where if you, you know, you're going to treat the, en the enemy that's captured well. They're, it's expected that they're going to treat you well. Um, and we're going to see if they hold up that end of the bargain. I had no time to ponder Kirsten's fate. Madam commanded that a supper be thrown to celebrate the capture of Fort Washington, complete with turtle soup. The house barracks bloated with dust and activity. 
The junior officers cleared out their cots, clothings, and maps from the second floor drawing room so we could scrub and polish it from ceiling to floor. The kitchen hearth was crowded with irons heating to press the tablecloths and serviettes. Madame hired the cook from the city tavern to prepare the meal. Fook said he had a way with turtles. She then chose the prettiest of the soldier wives to wait the tables. The ugly ones and Sarah with her big belly were to stay in the kitchen to assist the cook and wash up. My job was to ferry the food up the stairs and the dirty crockery down. The food began arriving long before sunup, packed into crates and hauled by sleepy-eyed boys. Three turtles, each the size of a footstool, came in a wooden pen. The sound of their flippers scratching made Sarah yelp in fright. Two of the turtles kept their heads tight against their shells. The third stretched out his neck and watched the commotion with wet, solemn eyes. While we scurried to finish the house and the cook butchered the turtles and plucked the pheasants, the hairdresser arrived to tend to Madame. He spent hours applying pomantium wax, padding, and lengths of brick-colored hair to fashion a high roll on Madame's head. The hair swept off her brow and soared into the air like a wave curling before a ship's prow. I thought the wave might crumble, but Madame did not ask my opinion. She wanted a pot of hot chocolate made with two handfuls of sugar, which was a shocking amount. Sarah and the cook were exchanging heated words in the kitchen. Empty turtle shells stood drying in the corner, and the cook's assistant stirred the thick soup bubbling over the fire. I grabbed the chocolate pot and left, not wanting to see what became of the poor creature's heads. As I served the hot chocolate and tidied the bedchamber, Madame rubbed her face with a Venetian Bloom Water Beauty Wash, said to remove wrinkles. After that came a layer of Mollynix's Italian paste to make her skin white as bleached linen. It made her resemble a corpse. And then the final triumph. She used a tiny brush to paint a thin line of glue above each eye. Madame opened an envelope and took out two gray strips of mouse fur, each cut into an arch. Leaning towards the mirror, she glued the mouse fur onto her own eyebrows, making them bushy and thick, as the fashion required. And truth. <laughs> in, in truth, she looked like a woman with two lumps of mouth, mouse fur stuck on her face. A delicate bell sounded overhead, Lady Seymour summoning help. So I just want to pause here. Um, I was lucky enough to go to Colonial Williamsburg, um, a couple summers ago and it was so fantastic and you you can go to this place that has um, historical actors you know they, they study the a person they're going to portray and then they dress up like them um, and it's it's a whole um, city in colonial time period dress and music and food and all that stuff um, and you get to go into all the different artisan shops and when I went I was studying um, it was artisan trades and tying that to um, STEM so science technology and education and math and um, I got to learn about all the different trades I got to interview the artisans that were doing it and one of the people that I found really fascinating was the wig maker and so Madam is getting her hair done she's got her little mouse fur eyebrows um, but sometimes if, if you're going to have those big hairstyles, if you're not going to have someone that's going to, um, you know, add that hair to yours, you might have a wig made. And it's very expensive. And there was one that I saw where it actually had a, sh a little tiny model of a ship built into it. And I think it, it weighed a, a several pounds. I remember being just shocked at how heavy that would have been to have on your head. But I love how um, Lori Halls Anderson has clearly done her research. She's figured out what the fashion would have required, that really white, pasty face, um, mouse fur, you know, bushy, bushy eyebrows, and then the giant wig. Um, so just kind of funny because if I rolled into to work dressed like that, people would be asking me if I was okay. They wouldn't be thinking, oh my gosh, Mrs. Daly, you're at the height of fashion. Um, so kind of neat. Okay. The guests will be arriving soon, Madam said, admiring her reflection. Aunt Seymour wishes to be seated in advance of them. You may assist her. After I helped the lady limp from her chamber to her place near the head of the long table, I placed a foot warmer filled with hot coals under her chair and spread a wooden blanket on her lap. She thanked me kindly and looked about. When I was young, we dined thus every night, she said with a sigh. I could scarce credit it. The table was covered by the finest linen tablecloth I'd ever seen. Each place had china plates, crystal glasses, and ivory-handled knives and forks. 
Candles were positioned every three hands. Salt cellars, each with a tiny spoon, and pepper mills were set in easy arm's reach of each place. Smaller tables and sideboards were positioned at the edges of the room to hold trays and dishes. One table was covered with wine bottles. Candlelight reflected back and back again in the polished mirrors that hung from the walls. I caught a glimpse in the hearth mirror of a girl with a mark on her cheek that trumpeted her shame. I quickly turned my eyes away. There was a heavy knock on the front door. It begins, Lady Seymour said. Go below, child. I set the tray loaded with the turtle soup bowls on the table by the door. Three more trays needed to be brought up by the stairs, but I allowed myself a quick peek at the company before I fetched them. The table was crowded with officers wearing splendid uniforms and perfectly powdered wigs along with several of Master Lockton's business companions. Lockton wore a cardinal red satin waistcoat, black satin coat and breeches, and shoes with silver buckles. The new clothes could not hide the fact that the master was grinding himself down with work. Long hours serving the British Commandant had melted off the fat from his second and third chins and created heavy black circles under his eyes. But his bags of gold grew fatter, and that was what he cared for the most. Madame reigned over her end of the table with the occasional flutter of her fan and a wave of hair above her brow threatening to crash at any moment. So her hair is like, wow, trying to stay up. And Isabel's just like, oh, it's not going to stay, girl. <laughs> Lady Seymour was the only other woman present, looked like an elegant spider wrapped in her black lace shawl. Her eyes were lively in the candlelight, and her cheeks had the color in them for the first time in weeks. The officer next to her was the size and shape of Edward, the shaggy bull who lived down the road from us in Rhode Island. The man did not have a ring in his nose, but he laughed with an impatient snorting sound. I hurried up and down the stairs with the remaining trays of soup and the roasted tongue and mushrooms. The serving girl cut the meat on Lady Seymour's plate before setting it down so that the weakness of her arm would not hinder her. The young soldier, who was appointed wine steward, danced around the back of the guests, keeping their glasses full. The conversating flowed as fast as the wine, the taking of Fort Washington, news from London, plans for a fox hunt. At this last, an officer joked that the next fox would be a tall sort from Virginia by the name of George Washington. That caused hearty laughter all around and glasses were raised. A serving girl hissed at me to go back to the kitchen. When I entered the room a half an hour later, my arm shook under the weight of the tray. The cook had prepared enough to feed a battalion. Pheasants stuffed with figs, stewed oysters, potted larks, greens cooked with bacon, pickled watermelon rind, and buttered parsnips. The pheasant smelled good. I had hopes that some might find its way into the scrap bucket. By the time I lugged in the dessert trays rice pudding, lemon biscuits, two creamed pear tarts, and an iced cake, the fire was blazing in the room much warmer. Lockton had freed the top buttons of his waistcoat, and the two officers had loosened their lace neckcloths. The heat that softened the glue on Madame's left mousy eyebrow, and it had begun to free itself from her face. She did not notice this. The serving girls and wine steward watched the progress of the eyebrow and fought to keep the smiles from their faces. The voices of the men were loud and booming, as if the wine they drank affected their hearing. I handed a plate of tart to one of the serving women, who carried it to the table and set it in front of Colonel Hawkins. "'So how many rebel prisoners did your men bag, Colonel?' asked Master Lockton. I passed another dish of tart. The Colonel shook his head. "'Near three hundred of the devils. Wish we could have shot them all.' My hands shook as I reached for the third. Why so? We've no place to put them. The colonel pushed the tart to the side and reached into the bowl of shelled almonds in the middle of the table. He tossed a few into his mouth and crunched loudly. I thought you were using Bridewell, Lockton said. That should provide ample space. The colonel snorted and shook his head. The prison is so stuffed the walls are ready to burst. We have to pack them into the sugar houses and the confiscated churches, too. He reached for more nuts. It's a right nuisance. Never thought we'd have so many. I'd say so many prisoners are a badge of honor for your men and the king, Lockton said. The colonel raised an eyebrow. We do not need a badge of honor. We need a decent plague to take them off our hands. The men around the table chuckled. The expense of feeding them will be staggering. The rebels planted the seeds of war. Let them enjoy their harvest. Lockton ate a fork full of tart. Force the loyal patriots to feed them. I say shoot him, growled the man who looked like Edward the Bull. Of course, then we'd have to dispose of the bodies. Messy work, that. Waste of ammunition, the colonel said, and some members of parliament would fuss like wet hens. 
No, I predict a cold winter will dispatch most of them in the natural way. Lady Seymour spoke up. What if the rebels decide that turnabout is fair play? We need to care for them so they do no harm to their British captives. With all due respect, ma'am, the man said with a smile, the rebels would first have to capture a prisoner. Given their blunders, it's an unlikely prospect. Lady Seymour nodded gravely. What of the prisoners they took after their victory at Breed's Hill? The table fell verily still at that. Talk of what happened at Breed's Hill in Boston was as rude as stating that Madame's false eyebrow was about to fall off. But Lady Seymour was the wealthy, elderly widow of a British lord, incapable of social error, so all pretended she had not said a word. Several men cleared their throats and reached for their wine. Madame lifted her goblet. I am told there are plans to reopen the John Street Theater, she said loudly. This heralds a return to civilization and order. Her eyebrow flopped into the rice pudding. The man seated to her right coughed loudly into his napkin. The wine steward's face turned the color of a plum, and a serving girl bit down on her lip to prevent a laugh. Madame avoided looking at her pudding. A toast, she said with a wobbling voice. A toast to civilization, Lockton added. I've heard plans for a cricket club, too. As the men roared in approval, I carried the tray loaded, loaded with dirty supper dishes down the stairs. On my return trip upstairs, I carried two pots of coffee. My trips up and down the stairs continued until my knees threatened to fold up and quit, bringing dishes down, carrying more delica delicacies and hot drinks up. Down, up, down, up. A hundred miles of stairs in one night. As the candles guttered out and were replaced with new, Madame and Lady Seymour retired to their bedchambers, and Lockton's business companions left to play billiards at the King's Head Tavern. It's kind of like pool, but a little different. Billiards. Billiards. The officers requested more coffee, lit their pipes, and rolled their maps on the tablecloth, stained now with splashes of turtle soup, butter, wine, and candle wax. The serving girls moved down to the kitchen, where kettles of water were put on to boil for the washing of the dishes. The cook was long departed, and Sarah dozed on a kitchen chair, her swollen feet propped up on a pillow. I picked up the enormous bowl of table scraps and headed out the back door. Miss Mary Finch always mixed table scraps with muck and spread the smelly mess on her garden come spring, but the lockets weren't much for growing things, not when the markets were so close to hand. Scraps here were dumped down the privy. I closed the door behind me and stopped. The cold air took my breath away. The sky was a black curtain, the stars ice chips whittled by an old knife. I wrapped the shawl tighter across my shoulders and pulled it high to protect my neck. Through the kitchen window I could see two of the women squabbling about who would wash and who would dry. The second floor windows glowed with candlelight shattered by the shapes of the officers circling around the map. I shuddered and my teeth banged together. Water would turn solid tonight. It was a bad night to be without a blanket. Would they truly allow prisoners to freeze to death? The soldier wife stopped arguing, and the men lit fresh candles. The stars wheeled above me, and inside, deep inside, something turned. I could not name it, nor recognize its form. I drew in a cold breath and blew it skyward. The air came out of me in the shape of a cloud. It drifted above the rooftops and dissolved into the stars. Would they let them starve? The stars said not a word. The back door banged open, and I jumped. Don't tarry, said Sarah. You need to dry the last of them glasses before you lay yourself to sleep. Yes, ma'am, as soon as I finish this. I quickly carried the scrap bowl out into the yard, walking past the privy, all the way back to the stable wall where straggly holly bushes grew. I glanced quick at the house to make sure no one was watching, then pulled aside the prickly branches of the bush and set the bowl down within it. I covered the bowl with my apron. On my way back to the house, I loaded my arms with firewood. I doubted she'd noticed that I left the bowl outside, not with me bringing an extra wood. I took another deep breath of frozen air before I opened the door, confused that I should be so awake after such a long day. I frowned as my thoughts tumbled and multiplied. I had been invaded. A dim plan had hatched itself in my brain pan without my consent, and I did not much like it. So I want you to prick predict um what do you think is going to happen why is she putting scraps of food in the garden in a bowl that she's covering what do you think she's going to do let's find out okay monday december 2nd 1776 
Young men, ye should never again fight against your king. And this is from a Scottish sergeant scolding rebel troops after the defeat of Fort Washington. I had to wait three days to sneak up to the prison. My chance came when Madame received an invitation from a friend who had moved into an abandoned rebel mansion in Greenwich Village, north of the city line. Madame smiled in triumph as she read the note, then told me to clean her best shoes. After the midday meal, the soldier wives helped Lady Seymour and Madame into the carriage. I brought out foot warmers filled with hot coals and heavy blankets to lay over the women, for the air was crackling and cold. The driver snapped the whip above the heads of the horses, and the carriage rolled away. The soldier wives waited until it was out of sight, then dashed off to visit their own friends. When they were gone, the house stood empty for the first time in months. I lined my shoes and cap with newspaper to keep out the wind and emptied the leftovers, hiding under the, scholly, the holly bush, into a bucket that I covered with an old rag. I stood across the street from the Bridewell prison and pondered hard. Don't do this. Don't do this. All around, the common folk went on their business, soldiers rubbing the cold out of their fingers, women wrapped in long cloaks and thick sh shawls. They walked over the ground where the gallows had been built last summer, where they hung the traitor hickey. Back in August, the Patriots had torn it down and used the wood for barricades. The British had built their own hangman's platform at the opposite end of the commons. It could kill three people at a time. The ashes in my soul stirred. Don't do this. Men stood at the windows of the prison, calling out to those who passed by. Few folk looked in their direction, pretending that the noise came from the throats of crows circling overhead. Go back. Tis not your affair. The whispers in my brain pan grew louder as I crossed the street. Madam will beat you bloody. He's not your concern. It's not your place. Go back. Go back before it's too late. The crows cawed and wheeled and beat their shiny black wings against the wind-chipped clouds. They saw everything. I stopped in front of the iron-studded oak door and frowned. He freed me from the stalks. He is my friend, my only friend. With that, the ashes settled and shushed. My arm lifted light as a feather and pounded on the knocker door. A giant guard opened up. What do you want? He growled. He looked like he'd been fashioned by setting boulders atop boulders. His hands were iron mallets and his face rough carved out of granite. He was a mountain cloth, clothed in a lobsterback uniform. Another do-gooder, he grunted when I explained my mission. He lifted the corner of the rag that covered my bucket and sniffed. You got any fink tasty in there? Scrap, sir, the mistress normally feeds them to the pigs, but she's a good soul and told me to bring them here for the prisoners, I lied. He grunted, peering into the bucket and poking through with a finger. Rice pudding? Yes, sir. The grod guard crossed the room, took a bowl down from the shelf, and used a spoon to dish the rice pudding from the bucket. And you're kin to this boy you seek, he asked. My older brother, sir, I lied. Always a stubborn cuss, made Mama cry herself to sleep at night. Why ain't your mother here, then? She's dead, sir. That much was true. The guard was more interested in rice pudding than my patchwork story. He shoveled several spoonfuls in his mouth and chewed while looking me over. Come on, then, he said, taking a ring of keys from the hook on the wall. I'll give ye a little time. The sound of the key turning in the lock brought back my time in the city hall dungeon with the madwoman and the rats. Despite the cold, a trickle of sweat inched down my backbone. We walked down a hall lined with four doors on each side and at the end a staircase. He stopped at the last door on the right and unlocked it. Here we go, he said. The cell was a little bigger than the one I had been confined in. It was filled with men and boys milling around like nervous cattle herded into a goat pen. There was no fire burning, nay, not even a hearth where it could burn. A short man dressed in black peered out of the cell's one window, stuck in the middle of the outside wall. The man's collar was flipped up to protect his neck. His hat was pulled down, and his hands were stuck in his armpits for warmth. The window had bars across it, but no glass. It was an empty hole, open to rain, wind, and snow. All turned to stare as we entered. "'Girl, come see your brother,' the guard said. "'Excuse me, sir,' I said as he started to close the door. "'What about my bucket?' He smiled. "'Needs further inspection.' No one said anything, nor moved until the guard finished relocking the door and his footsteps echoed down the hall. "'You'll be wanting him in the corner,' said the short man by the window. "'Show her.' A few of the prisoners stepped to the side so I could see a bundle of rags on the floor. Kirsten was laying on the stones. 
with no blanket covering him, nor a pallet under him, not even straw. His leg was still wrapped in the bloody bandage. His lips were dry and cracked. He clutched his hat in one hand. I crouched next to him, unsure what to do. The soldiers around us grew tired of staring and returned to their low conversation. I leaned close to figure if he was breathing. Finally, I put my lips to his ear. Are you dead? I whispered. He answered without moving. No country. Are you? I near jumped out of my skin. Cursed him? His eyes opened slowly, but bloodshot and bleary. Can you sit up? I asked. Suppose so. I helped pull him upright. He winced and leaned against the wall, shaking with chills. Here. I untied my heavy cloak and laid it over him. He protested. You don't have to. I interrupted him. Hush. Did you get shot? He pulled the cloak up under his chin and shivered again. In the leg. My luck held, though. The bullet went in and out, fair clean. Didn't break the bone. He stopped as a man nearby broke into a fit of coughing. I sat next to him. Was it awful? I asked. He closed his eyes and shook his head. You don't want to know. Yes, I do. When the Redcoats invaded, he started. We raced up the island to the fort, figured we'd hold them for months, then drive them from the city come spring when our forces could be stronger. Ha! spat the man closest to us. He rolled over to face the wall. Did you shoot a gun? I asked. Mostly dug ditches and carried rocks. The soldiers, they worked alongside us, and they drilled to get ready. When the battle finally started, the men fired their guns so fast the barrels grew hot. The cannon smoke was thick as fog. I saw the most horrid sights country, not fit for the eyes of any person. He swallowed hard. I wound up next to a militia boy from Connecticut. he just learned to shave and was a poor hand at it, razor cuts all over his chin. Said he was worried his pa was mad at him on account that he didn't make it home for the apple harvest like he promised. He fell silent for a moment, then continued. So this boy, he had two muskets, one his own, the other from a fellow who died in Long Island. When the Hessians came at us, the boy would shoot one gun whilst I reloaded the other. We continued thus, loading and shooting, loading and shooting, half the day. The British moved their small cannons up the hill and took aim, but I loaded. He shot. He paused to wipe his eyes on his sleeve. As I handed him his gun, a cannonball ripped his head from his body. We sat without a word. The ashes within me swirled and filled up my throat again. Around us men muttered low and coughed. Kirsten let his tears run. After that, I shot the guns for myself. I took a bullet in the leg but kept firing. An hour or so, Colonel Magaw surrendered the fort. We laid down our weapons and walked out. The British called for our officers to walk forward, and we feared they'd be shot. Were they? I asked. Not hardly. Hardly. He sat up a little straighter. Officers get special treatment on account that they're considered gentlemen. They have parole to walk around the city. They live in boarding houses and eat regular. The man who faced the wall muttered a string of curses that echoed against the stones. He said every kind of bad word imaginable about officers, gentlemen, the war, the British, and the Congress, and he cursed himself for leaving his wife and farm in Maryland. Kirsten's tears dried, leaving a thin trail of salt down his cheeks. You should go home now. Before I could ask one of a hundred questions, the key turned in the lock and the guard appeared. He stuck up my bucket. Um, inspection complete, he said, wiping a smear of butter off the side of his face. I stood, walked to the door, and looked at the bucket. Half the food was gone. May I stay a while longer, I asked. Sing out when you need me, the guard said with an unsettling wink. As soon as the door was relocked, a man with powder burns on his face snatched the bucket from my hands. I'll take that, he snarled. I held tight to the handle and shouted, Give it back! The man grabbed at my arms, his fingers like the claws of a panther. Enough, shouted a powerful voice. The cell fell silent as a tomb. The short man dressed in black limped over to us from his post by the window. Release the bucket, Private Dibblin, he ordered. The thief did as he was asked, but crossed his arms over his chest and stood his ground. She brought food for the black boy, Sergeant, he complained. Taint right for the slave to eat while we starve. The tiny sergeant stood motionless. Somewhere water was dripping. No one here will starve as long as I have breath. He turned to me. Excuse the poor manners, miss, but we've not eaten for three days. Hungry men are sometimes rude. I understand, I said. Would you be willing to share what you've brought, he asked. We would all be most grateful. 
I looked the sergeant in the eye. He wasn't much taller than me. There's not enough to feed everyone. I know that, miss, but we're all equally hungry. Don't fuss, country, Kirsten added. We fought together. We'll eat together. Outside, a heavy cart rolled down Broadway, the driver calling to his horses. There was an argument from the cell on the other side of the wall and a thump from one above. I handed the bucket to Kirsten. The nasty man dug his claws into my shoulder. The sergeant goes first. I waited for him to release me, fighting the urge to bite his wrist down to the bone. Once he let go, I gave the bucket to the sergeant. He looked inside and pulled out a piece of pie crust the length of my finger. He handed the bucket to Kirsten, who removed a long parsnip peel. The bucket made its way around the room at a snail's pace. Each man studied the contents and chose a small portion of discarded potato or bread or gristle. When it was returned to me, I was confuddled. There's still food in here, I said. These are fine men, the sergeant said with pride. Each took his portion without stealing from the next. Mind if we send it round again? No, sir. As the bucket went down the line again, the sergeant motioned for me to stand with him close to the wall. I wonder if I might ask a favor. What kind of favor, I asked. We need to pass messages to our captain. He'll be able to get word out of the city. Some of the other women folk who bring food to the prison prisoners are helping in this manner. I can't spy for you. No, no, not a spy, simply a message carrier. You come by here, I drop a word or two in your ear, and you pass it along. It will put me in danger. It's a way for you to continue our fight for freedom. The bucket was moving more quickly the second time around. I cannot, sir. I was not fool enough to let the Patriots hurt me again. The key sounded in the lock as the bucket returned to my hands, wiped empty this time. The guard entered. Kirsten struggled to his feet and handed me my cloak. Here. No, I said. You keep it. As soon as I fell asleep, it would be borrowed, little sister. Bring it the next time you come. I wrapped the warm cloak around my shoulders and was struck with a sudden notion. I pulled the newspaper from my cap and quickly removed the pages lining my shoes. Can you use this? Hurry up, said the guard. Kirsten smiled. Just what I need for a bed, he said. Go on home now. I nodded, grateful to be leaving and heavy with guilt. You'll be here when I return? Don't plan on leaving any time soon, he said. Oh, they're so cute. Um, so, she got a little food. That is such a powerful scene that they're each taking just enough and that they're sharing. Um, what does that show about them? That they have been caught, they're in prison. What are they still holding on to? Have they fully given up? So you might think about that. Um, how are they still showing resistance? Does it really matter that they're sharing with each other? What is that showing anyone? Um, we might think about that. All right, I'm going to keep going. Um, here we go. Tuesday, December 3rd, Friday, December 13th, 1776. Our private soldiers in your hands are treated in a manner shocking to humanity, and that many of them must have perished through hunger had it not been for the charitable contributions of the inhabitants. From General George Washington complaining to British General Howe. So you are supposed to take care of prisoners that you have, and it's expensive, and they are fighting a war, and it is not their top priority. And so General Washington, who's at the top of the... Um, rebel army is writing to General Howe, who's at the top of the British army, and he's like, hello, like, you need to take better, better care of them. Um, here we go. Lady Seymour was struck by a fever whilst visiting up in Greenwich. She had to be carried to her chamber, her skin the color of old beeswax candle. Dr. Destodge came to bleed her so that her bodily humors would go back into balance. When the bleeding was over, Madame saw the doctor to the door. I was dusting the grandfather clock in the front hall. Good, sir, madam said in a low voice. I wonder. I believe our aunt would recover faster at our estate in Charleston. She could sit in the sun for hours and breathe the healthful air. Do you agree? The doctor's bushy eyebrows flew up in alarm. South Carolina is hundreds of miles away from here, over bad roads. Lady Seymour would be dead by Philadelphia. Which was likely madam's intention, I thought. The doctor pulled on his gloves and picked up his bag. I doubt she'll be well enough to travel until spring. I will call again tomorrow. He tipped his hat. 
Good day, madam. Lady Seymour's bell rang upstairs as the door closed behind him. Madam squeezed her lips together so tight I thought she had bit them off. Girl, she spat, go see what she wants. By supper, it had been decided that I would tend Lady Seymour while she was bedridden. The master used his connections to the British High Command to secure extra firewood for the house, declaring that his aunt's bedchamber be kept as warm as the month of June. The heat of the room helped to bake out the fever in Lady Seymour's blood and ease her cough. "'Twas warm enough that I could go about in stocking feet, which was a comfort, for my shoes had taken to pinching my toes something wicked. So as she's growing as an enslaved person, she's not getting new shoes, and the lady of the house is definitely not going to be paying for Isabel to be comfortable. Um, so it's got to be so, I mean, if you think about like when your shoes get a little bit tight, it's uncomfortable. Um, and these are going to be probably made from leather or like a harder, um, material. Um, and they're pinching as she's trying to do all this work. Ugh. As she recovered, Lady took to reading all of the newspapers printed in the city. Whenever she dropped off to sleep, I would steal as many sentences as I could. Thusly, I followed the progress of the war. What was left of it? The flame of independence was sputtering and expected to burn out any day. The rebels had run out of ammunition, soldiers, and money. Mayor Matthews, him who plotted to kill General Washington, escaped from the rebel prison and returned to New York in triumph. The American Congress, frightened by the marching British, fled Philadelphia and ran to Baltimore. Newport, in my home state of Rhode Island, fell to the British too. When I read that last bit of news, I was stunned. I had not spared a thought of Rhode Island for months. It was several days before I could again sneak up to the Bridewell, toting sausages, crusts, and cheese rinds. The guard stole a few of the sausages and gave me only a few moments to conversate. It mattered not. Kirsten was not feeling up to much talk. I sat on the stone floor and checked the hole in his leg. It was hot, but free of pus, of yellow pus. Conditions in the prison had eased some. Folks in town had donated enough blankets, and there was one to be shared between every two or three men. The British promised each prisoner would receive two pounds of pork and hardtack biscuits every week. They did not announce that the pork was often spoiled, so like rotten, um, nor that the men had to eat it raw for there was no fire to cook it over. For my next visit, I saved my own helping of mince pie. I filled the bucket with potato scraps and mutton fat and put the pie on top. The guard took the pie as I had hoped. I love the good mince pie, he said as he unlocked the door to the prison, pie crumbs spilling from his mouth. Frozen bodies were stacked in the hall waiting to be buried in the pits. The clothes had been taken from the bodies to keep the living soldiers warmer. I kept my eyes on the ground, out of modesty. Kirsten was still not in the mood for conversating, not even a little bit. I thought he looked feverish, but when I went to feel his forehead, he pushed my hand away. The men snickered at that. I took my empty bucket and left. Snow fell that night. Lady Seymour prepared an errant list for me next, the next afternoon. She had spent the morning gazing into the fire and had not taken any food. I made a bold suggestion that she eat a biscuit with honey for her own good. You need strength to eat through the winter, I added. She set down her pen, picked up her teacup, and sipped the hot cinnamon water. I thought it pleased you when I left so much on my plate. Ma'am, the more I leave behind, the more there is for you to take to the prison. She studied me so closely I thought she could see my thoughts. That is where you've been taking the table scraps, isn't it? My head bobbed once like a puppet. Am I to assume you know someone confined there? I found my voice. Yes, ma'am. She sipped again and looked at me over the rim of her teacup. It is honorable to help a friend in need. How did you know I blurted out? She folded the sheet of paper on the table. These are the items I would like you to fetch for me. Purchase the ink and newspaper at Rivington's, but not the books. He overcharges. Go to that shop near the Baker and Hanover Square. Elihu said they haven't closed. I bobbed once and took the paper. Please, ma'am, I tried again. How did you know? Her gaze returned to the logs in the hearth. Take care how you go, Isabel. Many people think it's a fine and Christian thing to help the prisoners. I do not think my niece is one of them. Yes, ma'am, I whispered. So I, I just love Lady Seymour because, you know, people are looking at her like she's just this older lady that doesn't really know what's going on, but she is sharp as a tack. Like, she was at that dinner with the British, and they're all bragging about how they're winning, and they don't have to worry about the Patriots catching them, and she's like, oh, what about that battle you guys lost? And they're like, oh, roasted. Um, and then here she is, you know, recovering, but she's noticing things, and I just 
love it because she's just aware and just really, really sharp mind. Lady Seymour, okay, wait, I read that. Um, it started to snow whilst I was in Rivington's. The wind blew the snow direct into my face as I crossed the square, and I was grateful to step into the shelter of the stationer's store, for it was warm and dry inside, near peaceful, if such a word can be dis used to describe a shop. A jelly-bellied officer with thick spectacles was purchasing a tall stack of books from the man behind the counter. They were deep in their talk and appeared not to notice me. I took a slow turn around the shop, admiring the shelves, heavy with books, business forms, proclamations from Parliament, and General Howe, slates, thick papers, quills, and sealing wax. The books called to me. My fingers itched to touch them. It had been months since I dug into the story of Robinson Crusoe. I glanced towards the counter. The men were arguing friendly-like about a fellow named Hume. They both had their faces planted in the same pamphlet. When I trod on a squeaky board, they did not even look up. I reached up to the bookshelf and flipped my way through the book, standing at attention. The titles were near as long as the books themselves. Treatise on the Propagation of Sheep, the Manufacture of Wool, and the Cultivation and Manufacture of Flax by John Wiley, or Cato Major, or his Discourse of Old Age with Explanatory Notes by M.T. Cicero, or poems on various subjects, religious and moral, by Phyllis Wheatley, and countless tracts containing sermons and advice. My fingers backed up. Mama told me about Miss Wheatley. She was kidnapped in Africa, sold in Boston, and wrote fancy poetry that smart people liked. She had visited London and England. She had been an enslaved girl, but was a free woman. I took the slim book off the shelf and opened the cover. I had never read a poem. What if I lacked the skill? What if I were caught? Might as well throw myself in the river. Bang! The closing door startled me, so I near dropped the volume. I quickly set it back on the shelf and approached the counter. "'Can I help you?' asked the young man who stood behind it. "'Yes, please, sir.' I handed him the list. "'From the Lady Seymour.' "'I hear she's been poorly,' he said, as he looked over the list. "'Yes, sir, but she is strong enough to sit by the fire now and has a powerful urge to read.' He nodded. "'She's a good customer. I'm glad she's on the mend.' He quickly assembled everything on the list. The letters of Lady Mary Wortley Montagu, History of the Roman Republic, Volume 1, and the expedition of the Humphrey Clinker, and pulled out a large sheet of paper to wrap them in. As he worked the scissors, he paused. You knew that boy, didn't you? Pardon me? He continued cutting. Bellingham's boy, red hat, quick talker. He seized the paper, he creased the paper with his finger. He brought you here once, in May, pointed you out through the window, convinced me to hand over two fresh baked rolls, told, you, told me you were like to die from hunger if I didn't help. He smiled at the memory. I'm sorry, sir, I didn't mean to take your food. He pulled off a length of twine. You didn't. One of the advantages of courting the baker's daughter is all the bread a man can eat. He had not yet commented on my looking at the books. I feared he might try to trip me up, get me to say something. I ought not, but saw no other choice than to be polite. I hope your lady is well, sir, I said. He concentrated on tying the bow. So do I. She fled with her father to a village in Pennsylvania, a place called Hatboro. They make hats there. Clever. Don't you think? He tried to smile, but his eyes were downcast and melancholy. Perhaps tis safer there, I said. Aye, he said, finishing the bow, with plenty of young men eager to protect her. But that's a tale for another day. He kept the package in his hands, lost in thought. Master Lockton will settle his aunt's account at the end of the week, I said. Oh, aye. He gave me the package and waited as I settled it in my basket. I hear tell you're one of them who feeds the lads in the bridewell. A sizzling log in the hearth popped suddenly and I jumped. Not me, sir, begging pardon, but someone is mistaken. He crossed his arms over his chest and shook his head. That there mark on your face makes you hard to forget, lass. The heat from the hearth filled the room and made it hard to breathe. My, ours, my eyes darted to the windows and I fought the urge to run. It felt like all of New York was watching me. He leaned forward, put his elbows on the counter, and lowered his voice, though we were the only people in the shop. You tell them boys in the jail to hang on. There are plenty of us out here trying to help. Sir? He removed a slim volume from under the counter. This is for you. Don't let your mistress see it. I cannot read, sir, I lied. He snorted once as he quickly wrapped the book. Of course you can't. He pushed the package to my side of the counter. 
All who love liberty should commit the words to heart. I can't take it, I started. I cannot pay. I only have a few left, and those I should burn, he said with a wave of his hand. Read it. Pass it on, and keep feeding the lads. I bobbed once and hid the parcel in my pocket under my apron. As soon as I could stand close enough to the fire, I'd get rid of it. The last thing I needed was more trouble on account of independence. Yes, sir, I said, hurrying to the door. Thank you, sir. He raised a finger to his lips in a last warning. So, which side does he support? What did he reveal to her? Yeah, so he's he's on the um, Patriot side. Look how close we are to finishing, you guys. It's like really close. I'm so excited. Um, oh, I'm going to just try to keep reading. My voice is getting a little more sore, so I might have to pause a bit, but let's just go for it. All right. Saturday, December 14th, Monday, December 23rd, 1776. The distress of the persons, prisoners, cannot be communicated in words. Twenty or thirty die every day. They lie in heaps, unburied. What numbers of my countrymen have died by cold and hunger, perished for want of the common necess necessaries of life? I have seen it. This, sir, is the boasted British clemency. And this is a letter written from New York describing prisoners captured at Fort Washington. So people are, are saying, um, you know, surrender, they're going to show you clemency, kindness, forgiveness, um, but if you end up in these prisons, it's not guaranteed that you're going to survive. There's illness in there. As we saw in earlier chapters, they don't even have a fire to keep warm or cook the meat that they're getting. Um, so very, very bad conditions. And it was a very cold winter. Um, so, you know, sharing a blanket between a couple people is nice. It's better than nothing, but it's not really enough um, to keep everyone healthy. Lady Seymour regained her strength by the day. I was no longer allowed to spend warm hours in her bedchamber. She took her breakfast and dinner alone, but joined the rest of the company for supper each night. Madame was saddened by her husband's aunt's return to health. The next week passed in a kitchen storm of flour and sugar for Christmas was fast approaching. Madame's list of required delicacies was endless. Gingerbread, pies of brandied peaches, and preserved cherries and mincemeat, macaroons, blanc mange, Jordan almonds, candy sugar, as many kinds of cake as there were fingers on both hands. I was the dog's body in charge of keeping the oven stoked and the wood and the ashes cleared out, fetching forgotten ingredients from the market, and beating eggs, ten at a time, till my arm was near to fall off. Two of the soldier wives got into a terrible squabble the day the woodpile froze. Hannah told Mary it was her turn to fetch home the buckets from the tea water pump, and Mary said, no, it was Hannah's turn. Back and forth they went, the words getting hotter as their tempers grew shorter. I went yesterday, Mary said loudly, as she poured boiling water into the basin. You know that for a fact, because you told me my nose was the color of a cherry when I came in. Hannah shook her head and then scrubbed the floor. No, 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 that was two days ago. Yesterday I slipped on the ice and fell on my backside. Near broke my tailbone, I did. Could barely come up the steps this morning. You're a lying codface, you are, Mary said. Hannah threw the brush in the bucket, and water splashed on the floor. Who are you calling a liar? Sarah, the boss lady, came through the door just as Mary rounded the table. Her hands balled up in fists. Sarah was getting close to her time and had a bit of a temper herself. She slammed the door so hard the whole house shook. Shut your gobs, she shouted. I'll report the pair of you to the colonel if you don't straighten up. There'll be no more brawling or caterwauling in this kitchen. But, they both said, Sarah leveled such a gaze at the pair of them, I thought their hair would catch fire, and I suddenly saw a way clear to my own purchase, purposes. Begging pardon, Miss Sarah, ma'am, I said meekly. What do you want, she said, her eyes still on the other woman. I can fetch the water, the tea water, I volunteered. Mary shook her head back and forth. Oh, no, she won't. She'll tear at the shops to get out of her own chores. Make one of the men do it, I say. I'm the first one to wake to build up the fires, I explained. The shops are closed then. I'll dash up to the pump and be back before the sun comes up. She gave me a suspicious look. Why would you take on extra work, special, especially with it being so cold and dark in the morning? I was raised in the country, miss. Too much time inside makes me feel poorly. I like walking in the fresh air, even if it is cold. Twas mostly a lie, but the tea water pump was right close to the prison. Fetching water would give me a chance to check on Kirsten every day. Hannah picked up her scrub brush and knelt on the floor again. 
Let her go, I say. Saves us the trouble of freezing our tails off. She dipped the brush into the bucket. Don't know what possessed me to follow my Jimmy to this godforsaken colony. The next morning found me headed up to, uh, said it headed up island long before the sun rose. While I knocked on the guardhouse door of the prison, it was opened by a soldier I'd never seen before. A short man with black hair, sky blue eyes, and a scowl. You can't come in, he said after I explained my errand. Regulations been changed. Tell her about the widows, called another soldier, warming himself by the fire. Regulations permit civilians to deliver food and sundry provisions. But not firewood, added the man at the hearth, yawning. But not firewood, repeated the first man. There'll be regular patrols around the perimeter of the building to ensure that civilians do not tarry over long in conversation with the prisoners. And we'll be checking on the grub you give them, said his companion. Guards will inspect all civilian donations. The first man said formally, if you deliver contraband items, you will be imprisoned yourself. I shivered once. Are scones and jams contraband? Not yet. Back outside, I walked around the front of the building, trying to figure where Kirsten's cell lay. Some prisoners were already awake, their hands and arms wrapped in rags sticking through the bars of the window. Kirsten's cell lay to the back of the building. I rounded the corner and stopped. This was where the burial pits were dug. The pits were just a little smaller than the cells, dug down the height of a grown man. One of them had already been filled with bodies and covered again with dark mud. Two lay open and empty, sprinkled with snow like sugar on a cake. I did not know how many bodies would fit in each. I shivered again and pulled my cloak tight, then turned my back to the graves and counted the windows. Two, three, four, until I came to the window I hoped led to Kirsten's cell. The eastern sky had brightened enough for me to see all around, but the inside of the prison was dark. I stepped up to the building. The bottom of the window was just above the top of my head. I stood on tiptoe and stretched my hands up to the bars. Hello? I called in a hushed voice. Kirsten? Anyone? The nasty fellow who had tried to steal my bucket on my first visit, Dibden, leaned his face against the bars. He had a blanket around his shoulders and Kirsten's hat upon his head. Won't let you in anymore, eh? They changed the rules. Can you fetch my brother, please, sir? He's sleeping. I wanted to pull the bars apart, snatch the hat from his head, and thrash him with my fists and shoes, but that was impossible. I forced honey into my voice in a humble tone. Well then, may I please speak to your sergeant? Sarge is dead. He turned his head and spat. I'm in charge now. I'll take the victuals you brought. I started to reach into the bucket to hand the scones through the bars, but stopped. How do I know my brother's not dead too? Wake him up, please. Dibbon opened his mouth, but closed it without a word. His hunger was stronger than his temper, it seemed. He turned to someone in the cell. Get the black boy over here. A moment later, Kirsten appeared at the window. He was shaking so badly he could barely stand, his eyes half closed, teeth chattering. He had no blanket around him, and there was puke stains on the front of his shirt. His gold earring was missing too. Kirsten, Kirsten, I hissed, what ails you? What can I do? He did not hear me, or could not. He was insensible of his own name and where he was. Dibbon joined Kirsten at the window. Terrible, ain't it, how fevers and the pox tear through this place? There was a hollow laughter in the cell. Give him his hat back, I said, and a blanket. Is he getting his rations? He did not answer me. That was answer in itself. The prison was not a place of shared hardship anymore. It was a hole of desperation. So that sergeant might have been the one thing holding everyone together um, the last time she was there. But as it gets more desperate and it's um, just more harrowing and, and awful, people are starting to break apart. And um, that feeling they had before of unity, of we're all one fighting the same cause, is starting to break down. And they're starting to see him again as, as the color of his skin and not the soldier that was fighting with them side by side, helping in their cause. And this guy just seems kind of like a stinker anyway. You bloody beast, I swore. How dare you let him starve? The words flew out of my mouth without pause. Who are you to reprimand me, girl? He snarled, putting his face up to the bars. His breath stank of rotting teeth and snot pulled at the edge of his nostrils. He's a slave. He will, be no he will not be treated the same as a free man. He wiped his nose with the back of his hand. But you can remedy that, he said, with ease. I tried to keep my voice steady. 
How so? Kirsten was seized by a fit of coughing so violent I feared his ribs would crack. He choked on his spittle and fought for breath, then finally relaxed back into his stupor, leaning against the window. Dibbon glanced back at the other men in the cell before continuing. Our Captain Morse is on parole, lodged at the Golden Hill Tavern, we hear. Go there, tell him his men have fever and pox. One of our lads, Bridgebane, had as a father in Pis Piscataway with money and influence. If the captain can get word to him, Bridgebane's father could arrange for a proper physician to attend us here. Kirsten coughed again and moaned. Sweat glistened on his forehead. And the doctor would see my brother, I said. Dibbon hesitated, then gave a nod. Aye. And he gets a blanket and food. Dibbon said something to a man I couldn't see. A blanket appeared on Kirsten's shoulders. Kirsten clutched it around himself. And his hat. My voice was ice. Dibbon removed the hat and placed it on Kirsten's head. Lay him down, he instructed, on the rushes, not the bare floor. Someone helped Kirsten away from the window. I had no choice. I handed the jam-covered burnt scones up to the window. Dibbon stuck the first one in his mouth, then passed the others to the men, who suddenly crowded in the window. If he dies, you will not see me again, I warned. Understood, he said. I found Captain Morris carrying out rubbish for the tavern keeper. He was a well-fed man, wearing the brown coat trimmed with the white that signified he was a prisoner of war. There was a big gap between his front teeth, but they looked clean enough. He joined me in the shadows of the alley and listened as I quickly explained my mission. I'll try to get word to Bridgebane's family tonight. It is against all the laws of war to treat prisoners so badly, he paced angrily. How often can you stop there? Every morning. Good. Tell Dibden that I'll see what I can do to ease their suffering, though I fear it will not be enough. My brother is among the prisoners, I said. He's ill. Can you... Can I see to it that he's given his share of whatever Bridgebane provides? I surely will. Your brother was calm and brave during the final battle. He is a true soldier. A crow of a rooster interrupted him. The sun was fighting through the leaden clouds. I picked up the buckets. I have to hurry, he nodded. Thank you for your help. My apologies, but I don't know your name. I am called Sal. Do you carry a last name as well, Sal? I hesitated. According to Madam, my surname was Lockton, but it tasted foul in my mouth. I shook my head. He smiled. Just Sal, then. Good day to you, just Sal. Lucky for me, the overcast morn caused the other servants to sleep past their normal time. By the time Hannah and Mary staggered up from the cellar, I had the porridge bubbling and the tea steeping. I could not eat nor drink a thing, for my belly was tied up with fear. My thoughts chased round and round my brain pan. I could not visit the prison daily. I was sure to be caught and punished. But I had to visit the prison daily. Kirsten's life depended on it. But someone would see me and was sure to remember the mark on my face. Word would get back to Madam, and she would tell Colonel Hawkins, and he would set someone to follow me, and Captain Morse would be flogged for passing messages, and prisoners in Kirsten's cell would all be hung and buried in the pit. When I thought what they might do to me, I ran to the necessary and had me a good puking. But the next day I made my way up there again, food for the prisoners, water for the Lockton's, and every once in a while a message to the gap-toothed man in the brown coat at the Gold Tavern Hill. A few nights later, there was a terrible hullabaloo between Madam and the Master when he announced at supper that he was planning to travel on the next ship to London. He would carry messages to Parliament, conduct his own businesses, and likely return to New York by the summer. Madam was not pleased. First she argued that she ought not go. Then she argued, yes, he should go, and that he should take her with him. When he refused, she threw a goblet in the fireplace and carried on so loudly that Master and Colonel Hawkins finally called for the carriage and left for a tavern. Madame dosed herself with strong wine after that and went to bed. The night, That night, the temperatures fell so far below freezing that the biggest fire could not keep away the chill. I moved my pallet as close to the hearth as I dared and sat with all my clothes, my cloak, and my blanket wrapped around me. T'was so cold I could not sleep. General Washington and his men were holed up in Morristown. Folks said they were in desperate need of stockings and food. I could scarce credit how hungry men with frozen feet could win a war. They are fools to even try. I waited as the clock first chimed eleven times, then twelve, watching the firelight and trying not to ponder. When I got up to add wood to the fire, my feet wandered themselves to the pantry, and my hands pulled, loose, pulled the loose boards there. Under the boards were some sheets of newsprint I had saved and the lead piece from the statue of King George, my seeds, 
and the book given to me by the stationer. I carried the book to my warm palette and quietly untied the twine and removed the paper wrapping. I opened the cover. A fellow named Thomas Paine wrote the little book. He called it Common Sense. Mama always said that common sense was far from common, and that's why it was so special when you found it. The first sentence in the book did not seem to contain any. Some writers have so confounded society with government as to leave little or no distinction between them, whereas they are not only different, but have different origins. Society is produced by our wants and government by our wickedness. It took four readings to figure out the meaning, which I took to be that the life of folks is different than the world what rules over them. Payne sure did dance a long time with the notion before he said it. I closed the book and longed for Robinson Crusoe, still stranded in the study where Colonel Hawkins was asleep. I dared not rescue him. I opened the book again and attacked the next sentence. So Common Sense is going to be um, a really famous um, writing by Thomas Paine. Um, he's going to write that. It, it's going to start in London, but it's going to just spread. People are going to love his message of um, everyone having a right to life and freedom. Um, and it's, it's pretty interesting um, writing, so if you want to do a little Google search and check it out, um, there, there are lots of great sites about it. Um, and it's kind of fun to see, to kind of peek in at what Isabel would be reading. And it's a dangerous book to have. The stationer was talking about how he needed to burn all the extra copies that, um, that he had. So you definitely don't want to be caught by British soldiers having this book. It's a big no-no. Okay. Tuesday, December 24th, Wednesday, December 25th, 1776. Christmas is come, hang on the pot, let spits turn round and ovens be hot. Beef, pork, and poultry now provide to feast thy neighbors at this tide. Then wash all down with good wine and beer, and so with mirth conclude the year. And this is from the Royal Virginia Almanac. I spent the day before Christmas fighting a holly bush with a pair of scissors. Madam required its twigs and berries for her decorating schemes. My morning dash to the prison pump and tavern had gone wonderful fast. There were no new messages to pass from Kirsten's companions to Captain Morse, and the doctors secured by the rich Bridgebane family had delivered potions and bleedings to all as promised. Kirsten was spending most of his days sleeping, but he was not dead. And it was Christmas Eve day. The holly bits were tied with pine branches and set on the sills of the street-facing windows, Glass bowls of red berries were set on small tables in the drawing room, library, and the front parlor. Madam had two soldiers hang a ball of mistletoe in the front hall. This provided great merriment amongst the men and some blushing on the part of their wives. Um, I had never seen a house decorated with tree branches to celebrate the birth of the baby Jesus, but it did pretty up the place. The best was when Madam told us to hang dried rosemary throughout. That cut right through the lingering stench of boots and belchings. In keeping with tradition, I was to have Christmas Day free from work. I pondered hard on what I should do so many hours to myself. Christmas at home had meant eating Mama's bread pudding with maple syrup and nutmeg and reading the Gospel of Matthew out loud whilst Ruth played in Mama's lap. I was miles away from celebrating like that. I tried to bury the remembery, but it kept floating to the top of my mind like a cork in a stormy sea, and foolish tears spilled over. I finally decided to treat myself to a long stroll through all of New York, from the waterfront north to the Chamber Street, and a side-to-side -side wander from the East River to the North River, which some had taken to calling the Hudson. For one day my legs would be my own, and not at the beck and call of others. On Christmas morning Lady Seymour presented me with a new pair of black leather shoes that did not pinch any of my toes. Madam gave the soldier wives each a coin. She gave me nothing. When we returned home from the service of St. Paul's Chapel, Madam explained that my day off would begin as soon as I had finished serving the midday meal. Sarah had cooked it in advance, a sirloin of beef, smoked ham, onion pie, and a plum pudding for dessert. Master and Madam both filled up on the onion pie and hardly touched the fresh-baked bread. Lady Seymour ate enough for an undersized mouse. I ate porridge and beef for my Christmas dinner, a right curious combination, but a tasty one. As I cleared away the table, Madam informed me that my day off would begin after I brought in wood and washed up the dishes. Lady Seymour fired off a cannon blast of a glare at her, 
but Madame pretended not to notice, and the master kept his face planted in the newspaper. There had been heat rising between the two women for days. Madame was prepared to row, to row the aunt um, to Charleston to get rid of her. After the meal, the master went to order the carriage to take them to some admiral's house for eggnog. Lady Seymour said she was going to rest and required nothing of me. As the lady limped to her bedchamber and the master disappeared down the stairs, I picked up my tray that held the last of the dishes. Madame poured herself another cup of tea. One moment, girl, she said. I paused. Yes, ma'am? Madame said nothing while she stirred sugar into her tea. She sipped, wrinkled her nose, and added another spoonful, stirred, then sipped again. She set the teacup in the saucer and examined the walnut tarts on the plate before her. I stood like a statue holding the tray. Would she take away the rest of my day? Force me to wash the table linens or starch the master's shirts? Madame gave her tea another stir. You have been idling around Bridewell Prison. My heart stopped. She picked up a tart, considered its scorched bottom, and returned it to the plate. My husband's aunt says that you visit the prison at her direction, bringing the table scraps not good enough for the pigs. She declared that forgiving and caring for the enemy is doing the Lord's work. My heart started up again, racing so fast I thought it might escape my body. Madame picked up a second tart and scratched off the scorched bits with her knife before taking a bite. She chewed, sipped more tea, and swallowed. My husband's aunt is a blithering idiot who has completely lost her wits. You should have told me of her requests at once. She finally looked at me, her eyes cold as frozen coins. You represent this house, girl. Your visits could put us under suspicion of having rebel tendencies. I will not be ruined by you, be it through insolence, be, oh, sorry, be it through innocence, as Aunt proclaims, or insolence, which I suspect. I forbid you to go to the prison. My arms shook from the weight of the tray, as well as her words. She could do anything. Order me to the stocks, another branding, or a public whipping of a hundred lashes. She could beat me herself. She could sell me as she had once done to Ruth, only place me with the cruelest master who'd worked me to death in days. A pearl of sweat trickled down my cheek. Madame finished the tart and wiped the corners of her mouth with her fingertips. While my husband's aunt lives here, my hands are tied. She reached for another tart. But she'll be gone soon, one way or another, and Elihu will be in England. She popped the entire tart into her mouth, chewed, and then licked her fingers. That is the day you should fear girl I just love that characterization how um, Lori Halsey Anderson writes that scene because you can just picture that in your mind so I want you to make a mind movie of that if you can Um, we talk a lot about that in my classroom about just making a, a picture in your mind just how she's waited for everyone to leave just scraping off the burnt bits of the I mean she just is so blessed with her food that she has there. She's got this scone, she's got tea, she's got enough sugar that she wants, and yet she is just being so petty about everything. And I love the picture of her in that just her absolute cruelty just comes through and you can see it. After the carriage left and dishes were washed and Lady Seymour was sound asleep, I started my free day, still trembling from Madam's threat. How could I get word to Kirsten that I couldn't bring food any longer? Would Dibden let him starve if I stopped being his messenger? What if I ignored Madame's rule and continued to visit Bridewell? I walked block after block, pondering. I walked past the rope work and the brewery to the orchards on the east side, silent under the snow. I walked past houses that had letters G.R. George Rex carved into the front door, property stolen in the name of the king. Like Madame had carved her letters into my soul, burned the mark onto my skin, she can do anything i can do nothing the ashes of sadness and the buzzing bees of my melancholy all spun a storm inside of me and i walked and walked until my new shoes rubbed blisters all over my feet and the blisters popped i took off the shoes and walked in the snow once my feet were frozen enough the blisters didn't hurt as the sun ran for the west rowdy songs started up in the taverns and groggeries i found myself on the shore of the north river just above the battery Empty rowboats were tied up to a wharf. As the tide pulled out into the ocean, they bobbed and bumped against each other. 
A few lights twinkled across the water in faraway New Jersey. I thought of all the ancestors waiting on the water's edge for their stolen children to come home, waiting and waiting and waiting. A thought surfaced through my ashes. She cannot chain my soul. Yes, she can hurt me. She's already done so. But what was one more beating? A flogging, even. I would bleed or not. Scar or not. Live or not. But she could no longer harm Ruth, and she could not hurt my soul, not unless I gave it to her. This was a new notion to me, and a curious one. A group of soldiers singing loud as they could swayed down the street, very muddy and drink. I hid in the shadows until they were gone, then headed back to Wall Street. I passed several houses filled with Christmas carols, joy to the world, and I saw three ships, and the first Noel. A fat candle glowed on a parlor windowsill of a house on a corner, set there to guide someone home. So that's something really powerful that she's finding, that she, that she can be enslaved, she can be held, but then even in that, she can have her soul. And what do you think that means, that her soul is still free? That would be a really good um, little paragraph to write if you are keeping a journal or, or you just want to you know, pause here and think about it. Like, what does she mean that her soul is still free? What do you think a soul is? In my class, we could have a whole discussion about that but it might be kind of fun for you to write down some ideas. The Lockton's and Lady Seymour were all retired for the night by the time I returned. The house was still empty of soldiers and their wives. I built up the fire in the hearth, set my shoes and damp stockings to dry in front of it, and rubbed a calendula salve into my blisters. Christmas, Mama's voice reminded, keep Christmas. For the second time on the very same day, tears threatened. I rubbed them away and vowed not to cry again. Twas a nuisance. I found myself studying a loaf of bread on the table. A sharp knife showed up in my hand, and the loaf was soon cut into fat slices. A chipped crockery bowl appeared from the pantry, alongside the butter and eggs and milk and the sugar loaf, and the nutmeg grater all nutmeg grater and the small amber flask. I baked me a maple syrup bread pudding in the Rhode Island style. While it cooked, I cleaned myself up good and proper. I thought about stealing a piece of Madame's rose-scented soap, but that would have made me smell like her. I preferred to smell like strong lye. I washed my arms and legs and the back of my neck and my ears and my face, and I dried myself with a soft, clean rag. I frowned as I stepped back to my clothes, into my clothes. I'd grown some, and they didn't fit proper. I'd let out the seams of the bodice as much as I could and taken out, taken out the hem of the skirt. Much more growing, and I'd look a right scandal. But I wouldn't think on that now. I was trying to make a Christmas. I pulled on my dry stockings and stepped into my new shoes, even though they rubbed fierce on the plopped blisters. I put the bowl of bread pudding into the basket, tied on my cloak, and wound my hands into rags to keep the frost from biting. I walked out the back door. It was not yet midnight, so in truth, twas still the day I could call my own. I set my path westward to the burned-over district to Canvas Town. The line where... September's fire had stopped was cut sharp. First a house with no damage, then a house still bearing a black streak of soot and smoke, then a field of ruin with makeshift hovels crafted from tent, brick, and scorched timbers. Rats nibbled on frozen garbage heaps. The smell of the fire still lingered, tainted with the smell of filth and decay. But in the bleakness, there were spots of hope. A wreath was stuck on the front of a tent. Children's clothes hung from a clothesline, stiff with ice, but still sweet-looking. A butter churn stood watch over a neat stack of fresh split wood. Smoke swirled slow from the top of the chimney, dipped at the roof line, then rose up to the stars. I lifted my face to the sky, and for the first time in much too long, I prayed. I prayed as hard as I could, without words or shapes or fancy talk. I just prayed. When I was done, I felt cleaner than I had after my bath. I walked until I found a hut built against a lone brick wall. From inside came the sounds of a family, the papa's low rumble, the mama's bright laugh, the giggling children who had been allowed to stay up much too late and who did not want to fall asleep. I greeted them through a piece of canvas that served as their front door. The hovel fell silent, then the canvas was pushed aside as the father stepped out, musket in his hand. His wife came right behind him, though he told her to stay inside. It took some convincing to explain my mission, but I spoke polite and firm and held out the bread pudding. 
and the children snuck out in their night clothes and just about dove into the bowl. The mother took the basket and said, thank you, and then thank you again, and then thank you most kindly, and they went back inside. I hummed a carol as I walked away, finally feeling at peace. That's such a beautiful scene. All right, Thursday, December 26, Tuesday, December 31st, 1776. In the army at present, merit is measured only by rank. Those who are high in rank are clever fellows, the low are small folks, and those who have none at all, like us, are poor devils. We are nobodies. We have nothing. So this is from Samuel Tenney writing to his friend Peter Turner about his frustration with the privileges of officers. So um, you can see it in the way they're treated. The officer um, of their unit is on parole. He's able to be hanging out in town. He has to wear a different colored coat so they know that he's on parole and maybe not to say, you know, secrets around him that they don't want their enemy to know about, but he's treated well enough, whereas all the the people lower than them are in that horrible prison, um, starving and sick. Two days later, Sarah had me go with her to the fish market. Her back was hurting her fierce, and I was to carry the cod and halibut needed for fish chowder. The market was crowded with folks whose cupboards had been cleaned out by the Christmas feasting, and Sarah muttered rude things. Her growing discomfort had put her in a constant temper. The cod was easy enough to purchase, but stall after stall turned up no halibut. Sarah insisted that haddock or, car or catfish would not do, so we marched on. The air was thick with cries of stall owners promising the juiciest fish, the freshest fish, the fish fit for the king himself. Before dawn, I had made the trip to the tea water pump, but I had not dared visit the prison or Captain Morse's tavern. I was still confuddled about what to do. My thoughts wandered. I did not realize that Sarah had moved ahead of me in the crowd until a great shout went up. An oyster seller's cart had overturned in front of the cart stall, and two men were hollering at each other. The crowd halted, and I had no place to turn. Sarah's white cloth cap bobbed away in the distance as I looked for a path out of the crowd, but bodies pushed in from all sides to watch the two men arguing. When a hand grabbed my arm, I gasped. Apologies, Giselle, Captain Moore said as he released me. His eyes were tired, but his cheeks were flushed. My mouth gaped open like that of a fish breathing its last. I shook my head. He couldn't talk to me in view of all. There was no mistaking what he was dressed in that brown and white coat. I turned first one way, then the other, but bodies were packed around me as tight as could be. Morse kept his eyes on the arguing men, but leaned his face close enough to mine that I could hear him whisper, We must talk. Sarah had realized I was no longer with her. Her cap stopped, then slowly started back towards us. Her husband was a British gunner, so if she saw me talking to a rebel officer, Go away, I muttered. I have news for my men. The oyster seller picked up a carp and shook it in the other man's face. The crowd laughed. Sarah plowed towards me. I beg you, Morse whispered. Please. Soldiers appeared on the edge of the crowd to restore order. Come up to the tavern. Yes, yes, I told the captain. I'll come this afternoon. Now go away. The crowd melted under the eyes of the armed soldiers. The carp seller was explaining the ruckus to the sergeant while the oyster seller reloaded his cart. Sarah kicked oysters out of her way as she approached. "'Where in the name of all that's holy did you get to?' she asked. "'I was trapped in the crowd,' I said. "'I called, but you couldn't hear me.' She grunted and handed me a small fish with glassy eyes. "'This will have to do. Halibut is rare as hen's teeth today.' It settled in the basket atop the fat cod and followed Sarah as she headed away from the market. We walked in silence for a few blocks, her concentrating on her huffing and puffing, me trying to figure out if I dared go up to the tavern. The, the sky promised more snow. How long would Diblin wait before claiming Kirsten's hat and blanket? We crossed the street. Miss Sarah, ma'am? I asked sweet as honey. What is it? I chose my words with care. Has Madame Lockton said anything about me in your hearing? She tilted her head a bit as she looked at me. I, this morning, matter of fact, says you wasn't allowed to go to that blasted water pump said I should send one of the other girls, even though the sun's not not be up at that time of day, even though the streets be covered in ice. Sarah reached for my elbow as we trod upon a thick, a slick patch of cobblestones. But I like getting out, I said, and I don't mind the chore. We reached a stretch where ashes had been thrown onto the ice, and the going was safer. I don't answer to her, Sarah said as she released my arm. I answer to the king's army. I'd be right pleased if you kept fetching water. Makes my life easier. 
She stopped and put her hands on her back, breathing heavily. Her baby belly was so big she could have loaded it into a wheelbarrow and pushed it in front of her. She caught me studying her and gave a quick smile. The babe will come soon, she said. It'll be a joyous day, I said. I'll keep getting the water, but... But what? Could you please not tell Madam? Sarah stretched to one side and winced. What she don't know won't hurt her. It's not like she's up at that hour anyways. After the midday meal, I contrived to overturn the pitcher that held the tea water, dumping it on the floor. Clumsy dolt, Hannah scolded as I knelt to clean the water with rags. Don't be looking at me to trudge up there and get more for her high mightiness, Mary said from her chair by the window. She squinted and sewed another stitch. I've got to hem these breeches before the light fades. I'll run up and fetch it, I said. Double time, I promise. Sarah gave me a good, hard stare, sensing she might not have the entire picture before her. It's your neck, she finally said. Mind she don't see you leave. I near ran up the gold, Golden Hill Tavern, my raw blisters hurting with every step. Captain Morse was idling on the porch, smoking a pipe. He disappeared inside when he saw me, and he was waiting in the alley when I reached it. Here, he handed me a loaf of bread. You made me come up here for this, I asked. Take it to Diblin, he said, fighting a smile. There's a note baked inside. A note? It contains wondrous news. He looked ready to jump out of his skin. Washington has beaten them. Sir? He clenched his fist and unclenched them. On Christmas night, the general led a surprise attack on Trenton. He beat the Hessians, killed a handful, and took more than 900 prisoner. Are you sure? I thought someone had told them a falsehood. The British officers I knew were confident the American army was falling apart. Positively, he said with a grin. But they won't... But won't that make the British mad, I asked? I truly hope so. I hope the king is so upset he jumps up and down on his crown. This war is not over. Not over by a long shot. I handed the bread back. I'll tell them the news, but I cannot pass a note. That could land me in jail. He shoved the loaf back at me. You are a serving girl, delivering a tavern loaf to starving prisoners. You don't know about the note. But why is it necessary? The men need to see my signature to know it's the truth. They've endured so much, Sal. Don't deprive them of this chance to celebrate. It will strengthen their spirits. I pulled the hood of my cloak to hide my face as I approached the prison. The commons was filled with drilling officers, much more than usual. Their officers barked commands with urgency. The men marching grim face, swords flapping against their legs, rifles bouncing on their shoulders. Perhaps the captain knew was indeed the truth. I hurried behind the building to the right window. I stood on tiptoe and squished the loaf through the bars. Diblin's face appeared at the window. There's a note inside, I whispered, tearing to it carefully. I ran away before he could answer, willing my feet to move faster. I had walked a block south when an enormous roar erupted from the prisons. Hundreds of throats cheering, hooting, hollering, hundreds of hands clapping and feet stomping with joy. The noise was such that folks stopped what they were doing and ran out of doors to stare. The news spread from the prison as fast as it spread from cell to cell. The rebels had attacked instead of running. The rebels had advanced instead of retreating. The rebels had won a battle. Folks could scarce credit it. So that's a pretty exciting place um, to be. We are so incredibly close to the end. I'm just going to finish the book, I think. Um, we really don't have that much. At the end of this book, she has some questions and stuff, so that takes it up. So we are... We are, like, right there. So not a lot. Um, and then just a reminder, it is a trilogy. Um, I don't think I'm going to read all three books. Um, I'm going to go to something different. But um, if you've enjoyed this, um, I strongly recommend the next two books in this series. Here we go. Wednesday, January 1st, Tuesday, January 7th, 1776. It is with much concern that I am to inform your lordship the unfortunate and untimely defeat at Trenton has thrown us further back than we then was at first apprehended from the great encouragement given to the rebels. British General William Howe writing to Lord George German, Secretary of State for American Colonies, after the American victory at Trenton. Just after the new year came word of another shocking victory for the rebels, this one at Princeton in New Jersey. Washington's troops chased the British from the battlefield, killed a parcel of them, and took a couple of hundred prisoners. Folks could scarce credit this neither. Colonel Hawken let out a roar in the study when the news was delivered, and hit the unfortunate messenger on the head with a rolled-up map. 
Then he called for his horse and galloped off to headquarters. Within a day, the British promised boiled peas and rice with butter twice a week for their American prisoners, but they still did not allow fires in Bridewell cells. The men had to eat their meat raw. Their chamber pots froze solid at night. So all of a sudden, they're treating their prisoners a little better. Why is that? Yep, because they know that the Americans have lots of their men imprisoned, and George Washington had been writing saying, hey, you're not treating our prisoners right. And so now they're like, oh, I guess we better do that. The master's trip to London was moved up so that he could deliver news of the setbacks to Parliament and the King. Madam had finally accommodated herself to the notion of his voyage and found a way to turn it to her advantage. Whilst we prepare Lockton's clothes for the journey, she wrote a lo out long lists of items she wanted him to buy in England. I kept to the kitchen and cellar and woodpile when she was awake, but made my trips up island each day before dawn, looking over my shoulder at every sound, choosing a different path daily. The constant worry at a hole in my belly. Kirsten was stronger and told me not to fret, for he was not coughing up blood and his bowels were in fine working order, but he always asked me to come back on the morrow. The day of the master's departure, I roused myself extra early on account of I feared Madame might do the same. I deposited stale rolls and burnt hunks of pork on the window sill of Kirsten's cell, then crossed the commons on my way to the pump. There are few folks out on their own early morning errands, all bundled in cloaks and blankets blanket coats and shawls and scarves wrapped high you there a loud voice called out everyone stopped to look you there oh no a british soldier hurried towards me i relaxed some when i saw his face it was the mountain-sized guard who had let me visit kirsten's cell when he was first imprisoned the one who liked to eat haven't seen you around he said as he neared me i bobbed quickly the rules don't allow civilians in the cells he lowered his rifle to the ground and eyed my bucket True enough. What you bring him today? Bread crusts and burnt meat, sir. He wrinkled his nose. What about yesterday? Yesterday was kidney pie and stale almond cake, sir. He shook his head and licked his lips. Sorry I missed that I am. Wouldn't hurt to drop off a bite now and then to one such as myself, would it? No, sir, I answered. I shall remember that. He tilted his head to the side. Your master ever hire you out? Twas common in those days for folks to hire out their slaves to make money. The slaves did not see the money, of course, but if I had the chance to work away from the prying eyes of Madam, I'd be grateful for it. Yes, sir, I lied. We need a maid to clean out the cells. Dying men do puke out some terrible things they do. You're a said steadfast girl. Tell your mistress we pay her the going rate for your services. I shall tell her, sir. He shouldered his rifle. I'm on the night watch now. My name is Fisher. Bring me round some cake and I'll keep an eye out on your brother. Thank you, Mr. Fisher, sir, I shall. No kidney pie, though. Kidney sour my gut. Something terrible. The master left for London with, such, with much muttering on the part of his wife. She did not take to her bed as I expected, but was driven round to the home of Mrs. Taylor to play cards and no doubt, no doubt complain about her husband. While she was gone, Sarah birthed her baby boy in the cellar. I was sore tempted to sneak down the stairs and watch. I'd seen kittens and calves come into the world, but not babies. I had a powerful curiosity about it, but I dared not. I kept water boiling for the midwife and stuck cloth in my ears to keep out the noise. When Sarah stopped hollering, I crept down the stairs to see the babe. He was a round-headed fat fellow with big eyes and bigger ears. George, Sarah called him. You named him after the king? Hannah asked. Perhaps, Sarah said cheerfully. We never figured the colonists would hold on this long. My man was saying the other night that maybe the king should stop the war. Maybe the babe and us might stay here and not sail home. Plenty of room here, he said. She kissed the baby's nose. A name like George is a good one on either side of the ocean. Shh, warned Mary. The next day, Sarah and her George moved to a house set aside for new mothers attached to the army. I was sad to see them go, for I had wanted to hold the little one and make him laugh. Lady Seymour wanted to hear all of the details about the new baby. I thought maybe I could visit Sarah and ask her to bring the little lad by. Something about a baby always brings old folks back to life. When I mentioned this notion to the lady, she just shook her head. Not until this pestilence has left my lungs. She coughed into a stained handkerchief. Heaven knows when that will be. Her health was changeable and flighty. One day she'd feel strong and lively, and she'd eat three meals and drink a gallon of tea. The next she'd lie abed with a fever, looking so poorly, it tempted Madame to order the coffin made. I went to place another log on the fire. 
Lady Seymour was lying propped up on pillows in her bed. She shook her head. No more wood. I'm warm enough. Please sit down, Isabel. Ma'am? I'd like you to sit down, either in the chair or on the edge of the bed. I should like to talk to you. It was improper for a servant to sit with a lady as though they were companions, but she asked me direct, so I sat myself in the chair that was close to the fire. I could not figure what we needed to conversate on. She hadn't sent me for a newspaper or sweets for days and days. Had I displeased her? Thank you, she sat back and used her right hand to place her left hand in her lap. I will soon meet my maker, Isabel. I am a sinner in need of forgiveness. I relaxed. "'Twas the pull of death that made old people's go funny. Miss Mary Finch went the same way towards the end. Clouds would roll into her eyes, and she would talk nonsense for hours. Me and Ruth just sat polite and listened. The trick with addled old folks was to be agreeable. "'We all seek forgiveness, Lady Seymour.' "'I wanted to buy you,' she said. "'I wasn't sure I heard that right. "'Beg pardon, ma'am? "'I tried to buy you from Anne when I first met you. She refused, and we argued like a pair of fishwives. I rather lost my temper, she chuckled. Hadn't done that for thirty years. I knew not what to say. She studied her useless hand. When Elihu returned from exile, I should have demanded you be placed in my household. I was horrified by your treatment, and of course your poor sister. But then the fire. Her gaze returned to the hearth. I regret I did not force the matter. You would have suited my household. It would have eased her mind if I thanked her for wanting to buy me away from Madame. I tried to be grateful, but could not. A body does not like being bought and sold like a basket of eggs, even if the person who cracks the shell is kind. Isabel? She waited some word for me. I did not know how to explain myself. It was like talking to her maid, Angelica, who was so much like me and at the same time so much different. We had no string of words that could tie us together. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for telling me this. That was all I could muster. Forgive me, she said. I'm a clumsy old woman. There was a shout from the drawing room upstairs, where Colonel Hawkins and his men had been meeting. I stood. The soldier wives are all visiting Sarah. I should... Go on, she said, closing her eyes. So when I've read this story in the past, um, because I I usually read this every year to my class, Um, my students say, oh, why didn't she, why didn't Isabel forgive her? She should have. And they put a a judgment on that. And I want to challenge you guys to think um, about what is it that Isabel, why is she not forgiving? Everyone has the right to either forgive or to not forgive. But what in there is she frustrated with? She's saying that a person doesn't like to be bought and sold like, like an egg she's, she's referring to in there. Um, And so, here is Lady Seymour asking for forgiveness for not buying her. And what is it about that 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 Isabel is, like, thanks for telling me, but not not wanting that. So that that would be something good to, you know, to think on. But I I think it's a really interesting thing because um, at first, at first, um, when I read this to my classes, students would say, you know, yeah, like, oh, she should forgive her. But then as we paused here, and we usually have a really good discussion about it, it, it becomes such a richer thing and so much more meaningful that Lori Halls Anderson didn't have her character, Isabel, just be like, okay, I forgive you, um, because there's so much more going on. And um, as an enslaved person, you don't have control over a lot of things, but she can decide if she's going to forgive or not. That's one thing she can hold on to. And as a freedom fighter, is that something that she's going to want to forgive? Isabel has to decide for herself. Colonel Hawkins was in a right foul mood on account of all the forms he had to fill out and reports that were late. The war seemed fought with as much paper as bullets. What with letters and the passes and permissions piled on the table, orders received and recorded, recordings of conferences noted down. When I entered, he hollered that the room was colder than a barn and called me all manner of rude names. I chose the wood for his fire very carefully, the greenest, dampest logs in the entire wood pile, guaranteed to smolder and sputter without giving off any heat and even less light. After a frigid hour, he left for headquarters. It took me all my might not to crack a smile. The grandfather clock ticked off the minutes. Madam would not return home for a goodly while. 
She was a terrible card player, but she had loads of money to lose, so her companions would keep her at the faro table as long as possible. I peeked in Lady Seymour's door. She was wrapped up in her coverlet and sleeping. The blankets barely moved when she took breath. I pulled out Common Sense from its hiding place and read by firelight. In truth, there were some pages that I jumped over, for I found it hard to figure their meaning, but I gathered many of his thoughts. Americans had good cause to overthrow their British masters. A person born to wealth was not born to rule over others, and t'was good and proper to fight injustice. I kept the mending basket close to hand in case I needed to hide my crime. It's kind of odd to think of reading as a crime, you know, like, but it, it is not, she's not supposed to be able to read, and especially not that book. All right, next chapter. Tuesday, January 7th, Wednesday, January 15th, 1777. It is not in the power of the smiles or frowns of Her Majesty to affect me either by conferring pleasure or giving pain. I was wholly incapable of taking the place she seemed to assign me when I was presented to her. I suppose she assented to the assertions that there were no people who had so much impudence as the Americans, for there was not any people bred even at courts who had so much confidence as the Americans. This is because they did not tremble, cringe, and fear in the presence of majesty. And so this is written by Nabby Adams, daughter of Abigail and John Adams, on meeting Queen Charlotte of England. And Queen Charlotte is the wife of King George III. And so she's writing about her. So what is she saying it was like to meet the queen? Um, she's expecting them to tremble. And she's like, I didn't tremble. And she's seeing that as her pride of being an American. When Madame woke the next morn, her first command was for hot scones. Her second was that the seamstress must be fetched immediately. The British Commandant was throwing a ball in honor of Queen Charlotte's birthday in ten days' time. Madame required a new gown for such an, for such an occasion, perhaps two. I learnt of all this when I returned from the market with a fresh kilt chicken. Hannah, who had taken over the boss lady job from Sarah after the baby was born, was preparing a cherry pie. Mary sat by the window, mending one of Madame's skirts. The notion of a ball for a queen confuddled me. That's a long voyage for a celebration, I said. Hannah laughed. No, you ninny. The queen isn't coming. How could she? She's got ten children to take care of, plus all of them castles. Eleven, added Mary. She popped out a new one last spring. Even though the queen can't come, the officers always hold a ball in her honor, Hannah said as she rolled out the pie dough. Give them a good excuse to eat too much, drink too much, and make proper fools of themselves whilst dancing. I pulled out the feather bag and basin. And Madame Lockton is attending? The colonel will be her escort. Mary bit her thread in two. All the rich folk will be there. I ripped a handful of feathers from the chicken and stuffed them into the bag. Does Madame require anything of us? Not yet, Hannah said, carefully laying the dough in the pie plate. That will change, no doubt. I seen the queen herself, you know, Mary said, squinting at her stitches. With your own eyes, asked Hannah. I don't believe you. Well, I seen her carriage and she was in it. The back side of the carriage, mind. Actually, the back side of the troops guarding the back side of the carriage. But I saw the wheels bent down to it. She threaded another needle. Bet you don't know her name. Her Majesty, said Hannah. Proves you're not a Londoner, Mary said. Her proper name is Her Majesty, Queen Charlotte of Great Britain, Duchess Sophia Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz I don't think I said that right. How do you remember all them names when you can't remember from one minute to the next how much salt goes into the biscuits, asked Hannah. Biscuits are not as important as the Queen. I practiced her name from the time I was a girl, in case the day ever came when she saw me in the street and I could call out her entire gracious name. If I did that, her carriage would stop and she'd make me a lady-in-waiting on account of my good manners. There was a moment of silence while the two women considered this, then a loud outburst as they near fell over themselves in laughter. After dinner, Lady Seymour had a frightful seizure of the apoplexy. It looked like, just like one of Ruth's fits, except not with so much shaking. She fell into a sleep so deep I thought she was stone dead, but every so often she'd take a breath and once she opened her eyes. When she woke the next morning, she could not speak nor move her legs. Dr. Destudge arrived and bled her and stuck pins in her limbs and gave her a bitter tea. In truth, there was nothing could make her better. I was told to tend to her again, as I had right after the fire. I fed her and held the teacup to her lips and wiped her chin when she dribbled and helped her with the chamber pot business. This last was most distressing for her, and she cried. 
Then I wiped the tears from her face. So she can't go to the bathroom on her own, and um, and that's embarrassing. And um, she's also got some really strong feelings, I'm sure, because she asked for forgiveness and she didn't get it. Um, and so just a really hard place to be. Um, she knows that her son cares for her, but she's living with Lady Lady Lockton, and she's just she knows that she hates her. So just a really hard place to be at the end of your life. I heard Madam ask the doctor plain when the old lady would die. The doctor could not answer. I figured Madam wanted Lady Seymour to die as soon as possible, but not before the Queen's ball. If the house was in mourning, it wouldn't be proper for Madam to dance with the Admiral and make merry. A week before the ball, Madam ordered that Lady Seymour be moved to the parlor bedchamber downstairs so she could reclaim the largest bedchamber for herself. After two privates had carried the lady down, and she was propped up on her pillow so she could look out the window, Madam called me upstairs. I want this room aired and the linens boiled, girl. It smells of decay in here. The work of the day was simple and heavy. Strip the bed, haul down the linens for to wash, clean up the hearth, open the windows, and wash them inside and out. Take the rugs down and beat them in the yard. Sweep them off the floor. Take the rugs back in, close the windows, and give all the wood a polish. When the chamber was clean, Madam told me to open the windows again and let them stand open all afternoon to make sure there was no lingering pestilence in the air. I did as I was told. The doctor came right before supper and gave Lady Seymour a potion that would make the night pass quickly for her. When she was ready for bed, Madam called for me to bring up a warming pan filled with coals and run it between the sheets because they were chilled and still a wee bit damp. I did what she asked, then returned to the kitchen, dumped the coals in the hearth, and crept under my own blanket. She called for me again. The sheets were still too cold for her liking. I refilled the warming pan, carried it up the stairs, and warmed her bed. Then I stoked the fire in the hearth before returning down the stairs. The third time she called for me, I was sore tempted to dump the glowing coals onto her head, let it blaze, and ask if that was warm enough. But I did not. I performed the task she gave me, and when she called a quarter hour later, I did it again. The sun rose bright the next day, catching the icicles that hung from the eaves and jumping off the snow like a mirror. The linens pegged out on the land were froze stiff as wood covered in a lace work of ice. The clouds scull scuttled away and the sun blazed, turning the yard into a garden of jewels. Ruth would love this. If we were free and home in Rhode Island, and these were our sheets and our laundry lines and our snow, she'd dance like an angel. The pictures in my brain pan caught me by surprise. I could not clear them away. She'd clap her hands at the sight of the frozen laundry. She'd twirl in the spinning swirls of snow that lifted in the breeze. She'd plunge her hands into the bushes to pluck off the diamonds. She would do all these things and laugh and... The wind tossed a handful of snow in my face and washed it all away. Ruth would never see this. Never. I dried my face. Why was I thinking of Ruth? I'd worked hard to pack her away from my mind, along with the thoughts of Mama and Papa and the life Ruth and I were promised didn't help to ponder things that were forever gone. It only made my body restless and fill up with bees and wanting to sting something. I kicked at the new snow. It rose up, a sparkling diamond breeze fit for a queen. It was Lady Seymour who did it, her with her begging forgiveness for not buying me and telling me I'd have been a good slave for her, her with wet eyes and skeleton hands. Did she never think about setting me free? That would be a fine question to ask. Of course, there was no sense to ask it because her mouth didn't work anymore. I carried the big laundry basket out to the sheets. I'd have to hang them in the kitchen, else they wouldn't dry till spring. Another picture hung itself in my mind. The poetry book in the stationer's shop, the one I'd been afraid to read, Miss Phyllis Wheatley, went free when her master released her. "'Twas on account of her fame, Mama said. Master Wheatley looked the fool for keeping a poetical genius enslaved in the household. I'd heard of other slaves who bought their freedom. Folks who were given their Sunday afternoons to work for themselves, who saved their pennies and farthings for years and years until they piled up the hundred and fifty or two hundred pounds to buy their body and soul from their master. If I had Sunday afternoons free, I'd figure it a way to earn my pennies. I could sew or hire out to scrub stables. I'd even clean the cells of the bridewell, like the guard asked. I took a long stick from the pile of kindling wood. It would never happen. Madam would not allow it. She was set on keeping my arms and legs dancing to her tune and my soul bound in her chains. I pulled the stick back and it cracked against the side of the frozen bed linen. 
The ice shattered and fell to the ground, tinkling like pieces of falling stars. Thursday, January 20, or sorry, January 16th, Saturday, January 18th, 1777. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that's from the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America. Dr. Destuj visited Lady Seymour each morning and eve. She could nod her head yes and shake no to his questions. Yes, she knew who she was. No, she had no sensation in her feet nor her hands. She could barely chew milk-soaked bread and sip broth. Her mind had not got, gone soft, though. Her eyes blazed bright in her skull and followed me as I moved around the room. And when the doctor and madam talked, she listened in right close. Plainly said, she was as much a prisoner in her broken body as Kirsten was in his cell. Madam Seamstress came near as frequent as the doctor. The birthday ball gown had a scarlet red underskirt topped with a short gown of royal navy blue embroidered with gold. The hairdresser and madam spent hours consulting prints of fashionable ladies in Paris so they could design a suitable hairstyle. I was not privy to the details, but I had heard madam talking about jewels made of paste that would sit in her curls. She also wanted a small British flag to fly atop her locks, but the hairdresser talked her out of it. Hen and Mary talked about the ball every waking minute. I'm sure even the Queen herself would have grown tired of hearing about it. At noon, the guns at the battery, which the British had taken to calling Fort George, would fire a royal salute. An hour later, the warships on the harbor would blast a response. At six o'clock, the guests would start arriving at the ball, with trumpets playing and drums beating a welcome. The dancing would last until midnight. When the fireworks would explode over the harbor, after that, the banquet would begin. There was no way under heaven that Madam would survive six hours of dancing without having something to eat. I finished reading Common Sense the night before the ball. The bookseller was right. The words were dangerous, every one of them. I ought to throw it in the fire, but could not bring myself to do it. Mr. Payne knew how to stir up the pot. He went right after the king and attacked the crown on his head. I laid down one long road of a sentence to my remembery. For all men, being originally equals, no one by birth could have a right to set up his own family in perpetual preference to all others forever. The way I saw it, Mr. Payne was saying all people were the same, that no one deserved a crown or was born to be higher than another. That's why America could make its own freedom. Twas a wonder the book did not explode into flames in my hands. I buried it back in its hidey hole and laid myself down to sleep. My eyes would not close. My thoughts were churning up like muddy water, with dangerous eels thrashing through it. If an entire nation could seek its freedom, why not a girl? And if a girl was to seek her freedom, how could she do such a fool-headed thing, especially a girl trapped in New York? Best thing would be to break into the desk of the British commander, steal a pass and forge her name and his name on it, and act free and pigs were likely to fly too. Plus that girl seeking freedom would have to walk. She could walk a mile from Wall Street to the north edge of the city, but then she'd run into the guard station there. She'd have to sneak past them and not get shot. Then she'd have 11 miles of running to the north edge of the island. If she took the Greenwich Road or the Post Road, she'd likely be captured by one in need of a slave or in need of the reward paid for a healthy runaway. If she stuck to the woods that ran up the center of the island, she could be et by a bear or drowned in a swamp. If angels guided her safe through the woods and she made the north edge, she'd have to get past the guards watching over the King's Bridge, where New York Island touched the rest of America. I rolled over, my back to the fire. That girl could more likely grab hold of the feet of a passing crow and bid him fly her to safety. Better yet, sprout her own wings. The only path left was across water. A girl like that could not swim and did not own a boat, not to mention the river currents were fast and crossing would be noticed by someone who would raise a ruckus, and then the soldiers would line up like a firing squad and shoot that girl dead in the water. They wouldn't even bury her proper, just let the water take the boat and the body, and both would be consumed by sea monsters. I fell asleep cursing them that planted the city of New York on an island. My dawn visits up at the commons had become the most ordinary of errands. Madam never woke early enough to notice my absence, and the soldier wives were so grateful to avoid the chore, they never told. Kirsten had grown terrible thin and was still feverish, but his leg had healed up, and he greeted me at the window every day. 
After I left the prison, I'd fetch water and head back to Wall Street, passing by the Golden Hill Tavern, in case Captain Morse needed me, which he never did. So when the captain signaled me from the tavern porch the next morning, I was surprised. I had not seen him for weeks, not since the news of the rebel, rebel victory at Trenton. "'Good day, just Sal,' he said with a sleepy smile. "'How do you fare?' "'Good enough, sir,' I said. "'Is something amiss?' He winced and pulled his coat tighter. "'Nothing grave. No news of battle or a prisoner exchange.' I waited while he sought the words. "'I'm in need of a favor,' he finally said. "'It's of no worldly import, but it's a matter of honor for me.' "'Sir?' "'I must repay a debt, just Sal. I wagered Captain William Farr that the British would not dare hold this ridiculous birthday celebration. It's a slap in the face to the people who are starving. Yes, sir. He frowned and kicked at the stone, poking up from the half-frozen mud. But I'm proven wrong, aren't I? Thousands of pounds are being wasted, and, I s and so I owe my friend, Captain Farrar, a penny. A gentleman always pays his debts promptly, be they large or small. I was confuddled. And you want that I should... He threw up his hands in frustration. The British have confined all American officers to their lodging houses today. Why? They fear we might mount an insurrection while they're dancing minuets and gorging on stuffed goose. They have a point. The ball would provide the perfect cover for a surprise attack if Washington were nearby. So I'm prevented from making good on my bet to William, and he is prevented from coming round to collect his due. Tis a small matter of honor to be sure, but when in reduced circumstances these things take on greater weight, don't you think? Still confuddled, I nodded my head. Yes, sir. Good. Then you'll do it? Do what? Take the penny to William with my salutations. It will give him a good laugh. He lives on Chapel Street, a house with red shutters on the corner of Warren. Say you'll do it for me, Giselle, and the next penny I earn goes to your pocket, upon my word. Madam would be wig deep in preparations for the ball all day. The soldier wives would be too, for they belonged to the army of servants who would work at the birthday dinner. Lady Seymour required only a warm fire and occasional help with the teacup. A walk to Warren Street on a sunny day such as this would be most welcome. Happy to help, Captain, I said. The roar of cannons shook the kitchen just after midday and made me near jump out of my skin. I dropped the turnip I was peeling, and it rolled across the floor. What was that, I asked, clutching the table. Are we under attack? Hannah laughed and used the poker to push the logs to the back of the hearth. No, you goose, that's the royal salute for Her Majesty. Mary pressed the hot iron against the apron on the table. Do you figure they might need us early? The major said five o'clock, Hannah said. Give us time to finish up here. Will you get to see the dancing, I asked. Nah, Mary said. They'll be too busy running us ragged setting up dinner, but they've promised to feed us good. She picked up the apron and studied it for wrinkles. I wish my mother could see this. Me serving at the Queen's birthday ball. Too bad your mother's on the other side of the globe with Her Majesty, Hannah said. They'll both be tragical late to the party, Mary giggled. Madam sent a note to her friend, Jane Drinkwater, who agreed to bring her collection of necklaces and the latest gossip to tea. The news caused Madam to send the soldier wives pawing through the attic for a gown she had not yet worn yet this year. Hannah sent me to fetch more water, which I did with great pleasure and a short detour. The houses on Warren Street were a mix. Some were modest, two or three were rather grand with arches over the windows and fancy boot scrapers by the front door. The trees and fences in the neighborhood had all been cut down for firewood and made the corner of Warren and Chapel look underdressed. I went round the back of the house with the red shutters, knocked on the door, and explained my errand to a maid who fetched Captain, F Captain Farrar from me, who's fa hor <laughs> a horse-faced man with an easy laugh. Good Captain Morse is indeed a gentleman, he said, as I presented him with the coin. And you're the girl who carries messages to his men in Bridewell. Yes, sir. My lads are locked up in the old sugar house, he said, his smile fading. The one still alive. He stood there caught up in silence and his own thoughts. I tried to think of a polite way to take my leave, but could not find the proper words. The breeze came from the south and carried a salt tang with it. Although snow lay about and everyone was wrapped deep in their clothing, the appearance of the clouds made a body know deep down that spring was astir in. Yes, sir, I finally said, begging your pardon, but I must be on my way. Oh, of course, of course, he said, his eyes still distant. I walked down the path to Warren Street and stopped when I heard him call me. Sal, wait there a moment. I stood a while longer, watching the clouds and scolding myself for mixing in with the affairs of gentlemen and their honor. 
Several carriages containing bundled-up ladies and serious-looking officers passed along the street, pulled by shaggy-coated horses. Most folks took no notice of me than they would a cartman selling oysters or a vagabond from Canvas Town. Just as I set my mind to leave, Captain Furr came back out. Give this to Morse, please, he said, as he handed me the note. He'll know what to do. I studied the folded paper and made bold. Another wager, sir? Another carriage passed on the street the horses clip-clopping slow. He shook his head, the laughter gone from his eyes. No, news from headquarters. Don't tarry with it. He touched his fingertip, f- fingertips to the brim of his cap. I bobbled a curtsy and took my leave, hurrying towards the tea water pump. Should have known I'd be pressed into more message carrying. These soldier types were forever scheming up one thing or another, and it put a girl like me in a rough spot. Not that they ever thought about that, I didn't ask to ferry messages across the city for some captain I didn't know. How was that connected to my deal with Divin to treat Kirsten proper? It wasn't. Not one bit. The good Captain Morse and Farrar would just have to wait till it suited me for this last message to be delivered. If I didn't get back soon, I'd be in for it. I pushed through the back door to the Lockton's kitchen, still fussing about selfish captains who only thought of their own skins. When Kirsten got out, he'd have a debt of honor the size of a whale to me. I'd make that boy... I set down the water buckets, removed my cloak, and hung it from a peg near the fire. I stood rubbing my hands together and warming them over the flames. As soon as I could move them, I'd boil up the water. The door from the front hall slammed open. There you are. The words came at me like shards of glass. I turned. Twas Madame Lockton holding a small riding crop in her hand. Ma'am? She crossed the room and slashed the crop across my face. It hurt fierce but I knew not to cry out. How dare you, she spat. So what do you think she's mad about? If you're going to predict. Dun, dun, dun. Let's find out. I'm almost out of coffee, you guys. I've been reading so far for almost two and a half hours. (laughs) But it's so good, and we have to finish it. Okay, here we go. Saturday, January 18th, 1777. That even a failure cannot be more fatal than to remain in our present situation, in short, some enterprise must be undertaken in our current affairs. Wait, wait, wait. Mess that up. Hold on. That even a failure cannot be more fatal than to remain in our present situation, in short, some enterprise must be undertaken in our present circumstances, or we must give up the cause. Our affairs are hastening fast to ruin if we do not retrieve them by some happy event. Delay with us is now equal to total defeat. And this is from Colonel Joseph Reed in a letter to General George Washington. So they've got to do something. They can't just wait. Um, they are not going to win if they keep waiting. And he's telling Washington, we got we to gotta go. <laughs> got to make something happen. Please, ma'am, I started. Silence. She cracked the crop across my shoulder. The back door opened and Hannah entered. Oh, excuse me, she said, turning to leave again. Stay, madam ordered. Hannah let the door close and murmured, Yes, ma'am, her eyes stealing once to me, then quickly away. I felt the urge to run for the knife drawer. Madam paced in front of me. I have never in my entire life been so humiliated. She paused and put on a mimic face. I saw your little black girl talking to a rebel officer on Warren Street. Do you allow your slaves to consort with the enemy? I could not swallow or breathe. She brought the crop down with a crack on the edge of the table. Jane Drinkwater said this to me. Jane Drinkwater, the biggest gossip in New York. Madam paced again, her hair flying loose, her manner quite unsteady. I said, no, Jane, you must be mistaken. Not our Sal. Colonel Hawkins himself uses her for errands. She stopped suddenly. And Jane says, no, Anne, your girl was speaking to a rebel prisoner on Warren Street. It's hard to miss the mark on her face. From my carriage, I saw her take a note from his hand. I opened my mouth to protest, but she slashed at me again. This time, the blow opened a cut on my forehead. Give me that note, madam demanded. I have no note, ma'am, I said quiet. She held out her hand. Liar, give me the paper or, or I'll turn you over to the British commander so fast your full head will spin. Her voice shook with rage. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the folded note. Madam looked over to Hannah. See, you just need to be firm with them. 
Hannah said nothing. A drop of blood rolled down the side of my face. I clutched the note in my fist. Give it, Madame Lower narrowed her eyes. Do you hear me, girl? Everybody carried a little devil in them, or a little evil in them, excuse me. Mama once told me, Madame Lofton had more than her share. The poison had eaten holes through her soul and made room for vermin to nest inside her. Girl, Madame stamped her foot on the floor. The evil inside me woke up and crackled like lightning. I could wrap my hands around her tho throat. I could brain her with a poker, thrust her f face into the flames. I could beat her senseless with my fists. I shook from the effort of holding myself still, clutching the crumpled paper. Mama said we had to fight the evil inside us by overcoming it with goodness. She said it was a hard thing to do, but it made us worthy. I breathed deep to steady myself. I threw the captain's note into the fire. Hannah gasped. Madame shrieked and pushed me out of the way, but the paper was already alight. She dropped the crop and smacked me again in the face with her hand, and she had the, as she had the day I landed in New York. You foul, bloody wench! She reached behind her, picked up a bowl, and hurled it at me. I ducked, and it crashed against the hearth. I will sell you, she screamed. I will auction you at dawn on Monday. I'll sell your demon sister, too, to the most cruel, heartless master I can find, the devil himself, if he wants. She paused to catch her breath. Oof. Hannah stepped forward. I do believe there was a knock at the front door, madam, she said. But she already sold Ruth. Madam glared at her. Then answer it, you bloody fool. Didn't she? As Hannah left, Madam brushed back her hair, gathering her dignity. I still stood by the fire, where the note had burned to fine ash. I could not think what might happen next. Madam tugged at her short gown. What's that stupid look on your face? She said with a harsh laugh. You didn't know I still owned her, did you? Ruth? The name escaped my mouth. Brat, Madam spat. Couldn't find a buyer. Had to ship her down to Charleston. I shall tend the, tell the estate manager to get rid of her. Toss her in the swamp. Her death will be on your head, you insolent fool. Hannah came back from the hall. The hairdresser, madam. What? Madam wheeled about. What did you say? The hairdresser has come to prepare you for the ball. The queen's ball, ma'am. You must leave in a few hours. Madam cleared her throat and stood straighter. Of course. You must first help me into my gown. Hannah nodded. Yes, ma'am. Lock the girl in the potato bin, then come upstairs. Oh my gosh, so we just found out where Ruth is and that she's still owned by, she's still enslaved by the Locktons. Oh my gosh, so she's not on Nevis. Now she knows where she is. The bin was more than half filled with potatoes and smelled of damp earth and worms. There was not enough room to sit up. But lying down was like laying in a bed of rocks. I wanted to scream and pinch myself hard to fight the urge. I did not want to give Madame any satisfaction. Overhead came the noises of footsteps as the hairdresser performed his job and left. The colonel returned from headquarters to change into his dress uniform. And Madame sent Hannah running for this folder all in that. There was a sound of horse hooves on the roll of carriage wheels, and the front door opened and then closed, and the house fell quiet, save for Hannah's steps in the kitchen. A light appeared through the boards of the bin. It's me, Hannah said. She's gone. The light was set on the ground. Then there was a fumbling of a key in the padlock. The bin door opened, and Hannah peered in. I brought you some things. Here. She handed me a chamber pot, a blanket, and a mug of water. Taint right to lock you away with nothing. You ate an animal. Let me go, please, I pleaded. But before I could say anything further or reach for her, she slammed down the door and shot home the lock again. I'll be back by dawn to check on you then, she said. Try to sleep. Please, Hannah, I cried. Please, I beg of you. Her footsteps flew up the stairs and the door slammed. I thought I heard a sob, but perhaps I didn't. The bees overtook me then. As evening moved into night, they ate through me and hived up inside my brain pan with a loud buzz their wings beating me into submission. Someone whimpered and cried, and it must have been me, but it bat mattered not, for I was already dead. I was only a few days, hours perhaps, until my heart would stop beating, in truth, and the bees would fly off to hunt someone else. And then came the sound of a distant roar, like a lion just sprung from a trap. The bees paused, and I froze, waiting. No one was home except for Lady Seymour. 
and she was not capable of making noise. The roar came again. I cocked my head and listened. It did not come from the street, nor from the house above. It was not cannon fire. T'was inside me, a thought, thunderous, loud. Ruth was alive, alive in Charleston, in South Carolina, not on a ship, not on an island, alive in a town I can walk to. My toes wiggled in my sturdy black shoes, and my legs itched. I lay flat as I could on the bumpy mound of potatoes, and kicked at one of the boards in the bin. My heavy shoes made a terrible loud noise on the wood. I stopped, counted to one hundred. There came no sound from overhead, no commotion out on the street. I kicked again at the same spot. The potatoes under me shifted, and the mug of water overturned. I kicked a third time. The boards did not move at all. I cursed the carpenter who had built this tomb. There has to be a way out. I kicked, stomped, slammed. I raged and screamed and fought. Nothing happened. I stopped, wiped the sweat from my face, and closed my eyes. Think. The bin stood a little taller than Ruth, and was as long in both directions as it was tall. I reached up to touch the boards above my head. They were rough hewn, put together with cold nails. My fingertips traced the length of each board, feeling along the splinters and the knots in the wood. The top was as solid as a brick wall, each nail fastened tight. I fought back the panic that rose in my throat and tested the strength of each board that ran from the top down the sides. All strong, all sound. Think. Remember. When Ruth and I slept down here, the far corner of the cellar went muddy in a heavy rain. Maybe the damp had eaten at the boards. I moved over to the corner of the bin and scooped the potatoes out of the way, heaping them behind me. I sat and put my back feet on each board and turned and pushed. The third board I tried gave way a little. So did the next two. I moved the potato heap so I could best lean against it and push with my legs. I kicked. There was a quiet crack. I kicked again and leaned forward to feel the boards. The one had a piece chipped off where the wood was rotted through. The other had a long split in it. I leaned back and took a deep breath, then kicked and kicked with all my strength until the wood broke and flew into the dark. I took the stairs two at a time and paused before I entered the kitchen. The house was still silent. I hurried down the hall, past the grandfather clock, and up the stairs to the drawing room. I needed a map, and had a mind to steal a pass too if I could. I threw some wood on the fire, lit a candle from the flames, and carried it to the long dining room table covered with maps and countless papers. I lit the rest of the candles on the table as, it prepared, as if prepared for a feast, then searched through the papers, throwing those that were useless to me on the floor. Finally I found a small map that showed the colonies from Massachusetts down to Georgia, the distance from Rhode Island to New York was the same as the tip of my little finger to the first knuckle under it. From New York to Charleston stretched all the way down my fingers to the palm. The crackling firewood startled me. I glanced up. There was a movement over the hearth, and for an instant my heart caught in my throat. A ghost? The firelight brightened. No, not a ghost. I had caught sight of myself in the large mirror that hung over the mantel. I could scarce recognize me. My hands fumbled for a candle. I moved to the mirror, guarding the flame, and lit the oil lamps that were set into the wall. The mirror caught the light and reflected it back at me. I leaned in. In truth, it seemed I was looking at a stranger who lived beyond the glass. My face was thinner than I remembered and longer from brow to chin. My nose and mouth recollected Mama's, but the set of the eyes? Those came from Papa. As I stared, their two faces came forth and drifted back until I could see only me. I turned my head to the side a bit and studied the brand on my face. For the first time, studied it hard, the capital I that proclaimed my insolent manners and crimes. I leaned closer to the mirror. The letter was a pink ribbon embroidered on my skin. I touched it, smooth and warm, flesh made into silk. The scars on Papa's cheek had been three lines across his cheek carved with a sharp blade. He was proud of his marks. In the country of his ancestors, they made him into a man. I traced the eye with my fingertip. This is my country mark. I did not ask for it, but I would carry it as Papa carried his. It made me his daughter. It made me strong. I took a step back, seeing near my whole self in the mirror. I pushed back my shoulders, raised my chin, 
My back straight as an arrow. This mark stands for Isabel. The clock struck eleven and made me jump. I had much to do and little time. The fastest way off the island was a boat. Much as the thought made me tremble, I searched through the sea of papers on the table until I found a chart of the tides. I ran my finger down the columns. Huzzah! The tide would not turn against me for a few hours. I left only a pass. Colonel Hawkins had been in the habit of keeping them locked in the chest in the library, but had become sloppy and overworked since the rebel victories. I opened the drawers of the secretary table and looked through the large, bo large boxes of official papers. There. I grabbed the paper and dashed to a small side table for a quill and a bottle of ink. I crowded the candles in close together to give me enough light, took a deep breath to steady my hand, and dipped the quill. I took a second breath and bent over to fill in the empty bits of the pass. So it's showing in the book where it says New York and then blank, 1776. I wrote 18th January in the blank space. It had been some time since I wrote out letters. J wobbled and the R appeared to be an N. I set down the quill, wiped my damp hands on my skirt, and picked it up again. This is to certify to whomsoever it concerns that the bearer hereof, and then it was blank. That was where I had to write my name. I scratched out Isabel and stopped. I was not Lockton, nor Finch. Isabel, Rhode Island? That would not do. Isabel, Koofy, after Papa? Or Isabel, Dinah, after Mama? I closed my eyes and thought of home. The smell of fresh cut hay and the taste of raspberries. Robins chasing bugs in the bean patch. Setting worms to work at the base of the corn plants. Showing Ruth what was weed and what was flour. I opened my eyes, dipped the quill, and wrote out my true name, Isabel Gardner. Being a free Negro has the Commandant's permission to pass from this garrison to whatever place she may think proper. It was signed with lots of fancy titles that belonged to the Colonel and the Commandant and the King himself. I wish that there would have been space for Her Majesty Queen Charlotte of Great Britain to sign it too. She and me shared a birthday now, for I was reborn as Isabel Gardner, and that paper proved it. Saturday, January 18th, 1777. That the question was not whether by a declaration of independence we should make ourselves what we are not, but whether we should declare a fact which already exists. And this is from Thomas Jefferson about the writing of the Declaration of Independence. I folded the map and pass, blew out the candles, and crept down the stairs. I took the scissors out of the sewing basket in the kitchen and snipped the threads of the hem on my cloak. I opened the map flat, inserted it between the lining and the woolen layer, then quick re-sewed the hem. Next I dressed myself in all my clothing, two shifts and two skirts, my cloak, shawl, and the blanket from my pallet. I took a basket from the high shelf and loaded it with bread, hard cheese, and a piece of dried beef I cut from the slab that hung in the pantry. As I put the beef back, I studied the loose board in the back of the pantry. I pried it up and removed the lead piece from the king's statue and my cloth packet of seeds. After some consideration, I took out common sense, too, and stuck all of it in the pocket I wore under my skirt alongside the false pass. I walked down the hall, reached for the handle of the front door, and stopped. Lady Seymour lay in the silent parlor. I doubted anyone had thought to put wood on the fire for her. That was my chore. No, not any war. I was quit of this place. I reached again for the handle. But she was alone, old, and maybe freezing. It would only take an instant. I stepped into the parlor. Lady Seymour lay in her bed, her eyes closed, the covers barely moving. Her fire was near burned down to ash. I quick added logs and blew on the coals until small flames jumped up and bit into the wood. She wouldn't die of cold this night, not on my account. I was halfway to the door when I saw her s silk ridicule hung from the back of the chair. There were coins in that bag, coins that would help a girl set on walking to South Carolina, but that was stealing from somebody who had shown me kindness. But she stood by when Ruth was taken, and she returned me to Madam, but taking her money was still stealing. which was wrong, but I swallowed hard, opened the bag, and removed the coin purse from the bottom. When I hung it back on the chair, Lady Seymour's eyes were open and following me. The question on her face was plain. I'm sorry, I said. She's made up her mind to sell me. She nodded but once. I built up the fire. Would you like some water? She nodded again. I poured a cup of water from the pitcher and held it to her dry lips. She swallowed a little, 
but the rest spilled down her face. I sat down the cup and wiped away the water. I have to go. Please forgive me. Lady Seymour cut her eyes at her husband's small portrait on the bedside table, then to the coin purse that weighed down my hand. She gave a sharp nod of the head. One side of her mouth turned up in a smile. I'll put the money back, I said. Forgive me. She shook her head from side to side, her mouth moving with trapped words. I can keep it? Another nod and another pointed stare at her husband, because I rescued his picture. She nodded again, and a tear slipped down her cheek. Well then, ma'am, I'm happy to take it. As I set the coin purse in my pocket, she opened her mouth, and a small sound escaped. Did you say something, Lady Seymour? I leaned in close, though it scared me, for the smell of death hung over that bed like a fog. Her lips moved again, forming her last word to me, a whisper almost too faint to hear. Run. I opened the front door of the Lockton mansion and looked up the street and down, not a soul in sight. I picked up the basket, tightened the blanket across my shoulders, and stepped over the threshold. I closed the door behind me, walked down the front steps, and turned west. My plan was simple and foolhardy. Steal a rowboat, cross the river to Jersey, and walk to Charleston. I was counting on the commotion of the Queen's Ball to distract folks. If I could get to the boat in time, the tide would pull me away from New York. At the first corner, my feet stopped. This was where I turned north most mornings to head up to the Bridewell. I urged my feet west towards the wharf. They did not listen. My remembery called up the feeling of being locked in the stocks and my face being burnt, of him watching me from across the courtyard, him watching out for me. Twas Kirsten who made sure I survived. Twas he who had been my steadfast friend since the day they brought me here. I couldn't. It would be hard enough to sneak past two armies and not get stolen again by someone who would tear up my pass. And I didn't even have a pass for him. How to explain that? No, I couldn't. I looked west towards the river, then north, then west again. No, not couldn't. I shouldn't. But I had to. I had a debt to pay. Good evening, sir, I said, holding out my basket to the huge soldier, Fisher, who opened the door to the Bridewell guardhouse. Fisher grunted and yawned. What's your business here? It's going on midnight. I prayed the Lord and Mama would forgive the river of lies that were about to flow from my mouth. Colonel Hawkins sent me, sir, to clean the cells, as you suggested. The guard stepped inside and I followed him. He sat heavily in a chair and drank from the mug on the table. Terrible late to be cleaning cells. The colonel got wind of a, of a prison, prison inspector arriving. Nobody told me, he growled. I swallowed hard. Should I flee and give up on this senseless plot? He spat into the fire. They don't tell me nothing. What's in the basket? Food to keep me alive for a week, I thought. Help yourself, I said. He pawed through it, took out a soft roll, and stuffed half of it in his mouth. Maybe I should ask the colonel. I thought quick as I could. Yes, sir, of course. He's at the Queen's Ball. Fisher winced. Best not disturb that. All right. He stood slow and reached for the key ring on the lantern, and a lantern on the wall. But don't be asking me to help. Cleaning the cells ain't my job. I took the key. Yes, sir. Wheelbarrow's in the hall, he said. Once you've filled it, roll it back here, and I'll let you out so as you can throw the muck and filth in the pit, he yawned. Mind your breathing. I turned. Pardon? Prisoner's been dropping dead like flies. Fever. The men in the first cell were mostly sleeping or dying or dead. None of them had the strength to do more than stare at me in their weak lantern light. I gagged and gagged again as I carried out overflowing chamber pots and forced myself to take a blanket from a corpse. Hurry, I screamed inside. Hurry or it will be too late. Fisher looked up and chuckled as I passed back through the guardhouse with the barrow. I pitched the filth into the pit behind the prison and prayed it was not going atop any corpses. Before I went back inside, I cleaned off my hands in a snowbank. My teeth rattled with cold. No fun, is it? the guard asked as I passed through again. He pulled at the blanket around his shoulders. Hurry up now. I need me sleep. Yes, sir. I wiped my hands on my skirt. Almost done, sir. I did not open the door to the second cell, nor the third. I set the lantern in the wheelbarrow, pushed it down the hall to the fourth door on the right. I held my breath as I unlocked it. The stench, stench was overpowering. Men unwashed for months, and puke and muck and rot that was eating living flesh. Two dozen pairs of eyes watched me, burning in skull-like faces. No one spoke. 
I stepped inside and held the hand lantern higher. The faces were new to me, men and boys who had been moved in here after Kirsten's original companions died. Where's Mr. Diplin? I asked in a small voice. Died this morning, croaked a man. Everyone's dying. What about the slave boy? He pointed to a corner. Kirsten lay insensible, his skin burning with fever, his eyes rolled up into his head. I called his name and pinched him, but he did not look my way nor speak a word. He'll be dead soon. Leave him and run. A weight settled on my shoulders, like a cloak of iron. I bent close to his ear. Shh, I whispered. A blast of cannon fire sounded from the battery. More royal celebrations. A few men looked to the window. He's dead, I stood up. Can someone help me with the body? No one moved. Then I shall do it myself. I grabbed Kirsten under his armpits and dragged him across the floor and out the door. It took no effort at all to load him into the wheelbarrow. He weighed hardly more than a large sack of potatoes or a full butter churn. I dashed back to the cell, snatched his hat out of the shaking hands of a man who was putting it on his own head, grabbed a lantern, and closed the locked cell door. I could not bond the fate of the rest of the men. Some things were not to be borne. Before I pushed him down the hall into the guardhouse, I covered Kirsten with a filthy blanket. I'd stolen it from the first cell. You're dead, I hissed to him. No noise. In the guardhouse, Fisher was sitting on his bed, leaning against the wall and snoring. He roused some as I shut the door to the cells. Got a nasty load here, I said. Might take a bit to bury it. He nodded, already half asleep. As I pushed the wheelbarrow into the night, my legs shook so hard I thought for sure they'd set the earth to trembling and bring the whole building crashing to the ground. So clever, right? Put him in the wheelbarrow and snuck him out. Saturday, January 18th. Sunday, January 19th, 1777. And this is the last chapter. Everything that is right or reasonable pleads for separation. The blood of the slain, the weeping voice of nature cries, tis time to part. And that's from Thomas Paine's Common Sense. So saying we need to change our government. The prison was ten blocks from the wharf. I covered the first eight blocks as fast as a girl pushing a near-dead lump of a boy could. Then I stopped. The sentry fire was lit at the corner, burning between us, and the last two blocks to the wharf. Six British guards stood warming their hands, their muskets leaning against the small pile of firewood. A dog lay at their feet, head resting on its front paws. One of the men stretched his arms over his head and gave a mighty yawn, and his companions laughed at him. The dog lifted his head once and looked in our direction, but a soldier reached down to scratch his ears, and he relaxed. If I tried to push the wheelbarrow over the cobblestones, we'd be arrested in an instant. If it were half an hour earlier, we could have tracked backwards and gone down another street, but the tide wouldn't wait. I backed up slow as I could, cringing with every creak of the wheels. Once we were well out of sight of the men, I pulled the blanket off Kirsten. Get up, I whispered, as I helped him from the barrel. We need to get past those soldiers. After that, it's only two blocks to the river. Boat, he asked, leaning against the wall. Of course. Follow me. Stay close. He took one step forward and collapsed against me, the two of us crumpling to the ground. No, I scolded as I stood and pulled him to his feet. You have to try harder. Sorry, country, he muttered. He was not strong enough to walk on his own. I was not strong enough to carry him on my back, not after pushing him so far. I pulled his arm across my shoulder and had him lean on me heavily. Step quiet, I whispered as we drew close to the corner again. Twenty paces of open street separated us from the shadows on the other side. One of the soldiers walked to the woodpile, picked up a split log, carried it to the fire, and tossed it onto the flames. For the moment, all the men had their backs to us. Ready, I said into Kirsten's ear. He nodded. I drew a deep breath, and we started to walk, soft as we could. Twenty paces stretched twenty miles, every faint crunch of our shoes sounding like gunshot. Five steps I counted silently. Six. Seven. Kirsten had little strength in his legs. He faltered and almost fell again. I wrapped my other arm around him and clutched his shirt. Eight. Nine. Ten. The dog lifted his head. He stared right at me and barked. One of the soldiers, startled, shouted, Look at that! and pointed to the sky. The heavens exploded into the red glare of rockets and white fountains of light. 
Kirsten and I stood as if planted, amazed at the sight of the fireworks being shot off in honor of Queen Charlotte. The dog barked furiously in our direction, but the soldiers were all staring at the illuminations above. The noise rolled up. Booms that sounded like thunder and cannons. The men all smiled and laughed at the spectacle. I dragged Kirsten across the street and down the last two blocks to the wharf. It was dark. No watch posted, as I had hoped. Thank you, Mama, I muttered as we crawled into a rowboat. Kirsten groaned. What'd you say? I untied us from the wharf. Never mind. But he was already insensible again. I picked up the oars. I rowed that river. I rode that river like it was a horse delivering me from the devil. My hands blistered, the blisters popped, they reformed and popped again. I rode with my hands slick with blood, my back, my shoulders, my arms. They pulled with the strength of a thousand armloads of firewood split and carried, of water's bu water buckets toted for miles, of the burdens of every New York day and New York night boiled into two miles of water that I was going to cross. Set after set of the Queen's fireworks exploded over the roofs of the city, over the canvas town, over the mansions that held the King's subject in their ball gowns and fancy dress uniforms. Her fireworks blasted off everybody, and everybody gazed into the sky, and I rode and rode and rode past their homes, aside their warehouses, underneath their cannons, and out into the open harbor betwixt New York Island and New Jersey. My wits wandered some. About the time my hands started bleeding, tongues of fog oozed across the water and curled around the bits of ice that floated past. I saw in the fog the forms of people. They never came close enough that I could see their faces. Once I reached out, feeling a warm presence, but I near tipped the boat over and had to grab the oar before it slid away. My hands plunged into the icy water, and I rowed and rowed, but it didn't hurt after that because my hands had froze. I rowed and the tide pulled and the ghosts who could indeed travel over water, tugged my boat with all their strength. My eyes closed and the moon drew me west away from the island of my melancholy. When my eyes opened, I knew I had died and passed into glory. Heaven was crystal lit with white angel fire, colored peach at the edges. Heaven smelled of wood smoke. I blink. I blinked. The Bible did not mention that heaven smelled of wood smoke. I blinked again. When I opened my eyes, they watered because of the bright morning light. The rowboat had come ashore in a tangle of bushes that overhung a small bank at the side of the river. The branches overhead were all coated in ice. I was coated in ice, too, that fractured and crackled as I moved. I looked to the water, then to the rising sun, then to the water again. I looked around me. No houses, no ships, no wharves. The river was narrow and flowing out to sea, south. The sun rose beyond the water. At the other side of the river, I was on the bank. I was in Jersey. I had set myself free. I wiped at the water that flowed down my cheeks and kicked at the stinking bundle at the bottom of the boat. You alive? I asked. The bundle groaned and pushed aside the shredded blanket. Kirsten lifted his head enough to look at me, sitting there with a full grin on my face. Where are we? He asked in a thin voice. I think we just crossed the River Jordan. I stood up, steadied myself as the boat rocked a bit and offered him my hand. Can you walk? Ah! And so that's it. Um, remember the the um, grandfather at the water pump was saying, whatever is between you and freedom is your River Jordan, and she just crossed it. Um, so her story is going to continue. Um, there are a total of three books. Um, there's this one, then there's Forge, and then the last one is Ashes. And so she has escaped... Um, the second book is told so this one is from the perspective of Isabel the next book is from the perspective of Kirsten and it is probably my favorite one well oh gosh I love them all but I would strongly recommend reading them um, I hope you guys enjoy Chains and um, I am definitely going to go rest my voice because I've been reading for almost three hours at this point so happy 4th of July you guys um, happy Treason Day and I hope you have a good day bye